everybody and and uh, welcome to this uh, evening uh, session um, related to environmental geoarchaeology. Uh, both uh, Professor Iliopoulos and myself, we welcome you here and uh, we do hope uh, you enjoy this uh, session. We will uh, start with uh, our colleague, uh, colleague from um, uh, Shanghai Art and Design Academy uh, from China, Lei Kui uh, Huing, um, with um, uh, a lecture related to a study on origin of a grotto with converted uh, bucket roof in a Kuisi cave uh, centering on the Kizil Grotto. Um, dear uh, colleague uh, Huing, uh, the floor is yours. Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. Uh, it's my great pleasure, indeed, for me to be able to to be able to attend this meeting. And uh, today, I would like to to present my reports, uh, uh, the study on the origin and development of culture covered bucket roof grottoes centered on Kazil Q one one seven. In the first part of my report, I'm going to begin with a few general comments uh, concerning the uh, history of uh, Kucha and Kazil, and uh, I will give some uh, uh, little literature review. Uh, Kazil Gutu are located in, in, in Baichun, Xinjiang, Xinjiang, China, what, what, what is so called Xinjiang Vigor Autonomous Region. Now, historically, Kazil Gutu belonged to ancient state of Kucha and North Road of Silk Road. And at present, there are uh, uh, 269 number caves. Uh, Buddhism spread, when Buddhism spread to East, the Asian country of culture was the first affected um, and the transcend and hub of Buddhism in China. It continuously spread Buddhist knowledge concepts to China and Buddhism art carrying this Buddhist knowledge and concept also continuously gather from here to the East. And at the same time, Kucha is an important town and Silk Road, where Eastern and Western culture covers. Therefore, Kucha Muru are also integrated with India, Greek, Rome, Persian, a central place culture and integration. According to the documents and relevant uh, and earliest Buddhist scriptures, and Kucha Muru reflects uh, Mahayana Buddhism and the scripture most closely related to Miru is fundamentally speaking, there is a, uh, there is a, a, North Road, a, a North Silk Road and the South Silk Road. Um, and next I will introduce a brief, uh, <clears throat> brief uh, literature review, a little. <clears throat> when it comes come to, to Kuzu Pension, it is impossible to mention a German scholar who contributed a great contribution to, to Kuzil painting and Kuzil cave. Uh, we, as we know, growing reader and the local and the wider Schmid who made a layer a great foundation for the research of uh, Kuzil painting. Uh, this part I will give some my research uh, how to I, I I raise my question my problem in when I research the the Kuzer grottoes when you come to Kuzer grotto uh, covered bucket roots is very strange concept many people will think of covered bucket roots a building in in Hershey area China in Hershey area in the past. Academic circle have long reached a consensus on the shape of division of culture grotto. That is, the shape of culture grotto, including square grotto um, and central pillar grotto. Uh, in fact, there are simply two types square grotto and central pillar grotto. And the judgment 
is based on plan shape of glue tubes, regardless of the fact that the top of a square, square glue tube and the central pillar glue tube are mostly boom. Academic circles have not paid attention to the glue tube with booked roof, uh, nor regard them as a type. The concept of booked, book, bucket roof also does not exist in culture. Therefore, both early scholar and the current scholar have classified 117 glue tube and square glue tube, and the relevant article has not been seen. Scholar general do not believe and there is a covered, covered <clears throat> bucket glue tube, uh, what Ch Chinese name Fudou Cave in culture, and there is no relevant research on its origin. Kazil K117 is just a okay, whose main chamber is, is covered with bucket roof. Uh, K117 is located in the valley area in, in Kazil. Let's look at the picture. This is <clears throat> a stream, a stream flow, flows between a two mountains. Uh, 117 cave is located, seated here. We can give you a specific picture. This is 117 cave. On the left side is 116. On the right side is 118. This three cave is is considered to be one of the most uh, <clears throat> oldest cave in Kazil. Uh, let's give you give you some uh, centripetal cave. Uh, we compare this difference a uh, different uh, type of a cave. A centripetal cave is, is very common in in Kazil. Kazil, we can. Uh, we can see some semi-circle, semi-circle uh, top, semi-circle top. This is a square glue tone, and uh, the top is very, uh, very, <clears throat> is, is tall though, which I mean tall though, cave. And this is a <clears throat> square glue tone, and the top is dome. Let's look at the 117, very strange. The top is, is quite uh, a Fudou, Fudou cave, a Chinese name Fudou cave. Uh, this is reconstructed, reconstructed by using computer. And this is a picture I, I made, I, I depict in the cave. Uh, this is reconstruction by uh, by computer, we can see clearly their top is quite strange, very different from other we we showed before other the the, the type of kit. This is one one six on the left of one one seven. This is one one eight. Uh, we we can see. Uh, on the on the right of one one seven, the main chamber is the top is dorm uh, is is semicircular, and uh, the entry chamber is is close to to Taodo Taodo cave. It's a central pillar cave. And central pillar cave. This is one one five. We can see the <clears throat> main chamber is is semi circle top, and the entry chamber is Taodou cave. Just very very close to to one one seven. This is <clears throat> cave one two seven. Uh, is very close to, we can see, is very close to, to 117. This is a statistical table uh, I <clears throat> made. We found, we found some 117, 127, 115. This is a covered bucket roof grew to.
uh, 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 let's look at the age, the age of Kazil 117K. Uh, 117K, we can, we, the first type, <clears throat> we found some location of sample uh, from the chamber of 117. The first sample is 242 AD. The second is 427. The question is, uh, could the covered bucket roof go to online in Kazil? Why did Kazil 117 cave another covered bucket roof go to come from? Uh, this is, uh, <clears throat> is a Kucha, uh, very close to Kazil, Kazil uh, cave, and um, Kucha Friendly Road, now uh, 2007. I found some tomb, tomb group. Uh, the, the, the tomb is very near to ancient city of uh, ancient city of Kuchu, Chutsu, Chutsu. We found the, the, the type of uh, <clears throat> the type of tomb, Kuchu Friendship Road, but the. The tomb is made of brick. Let's look at, and we found some remains. This tomb we we found is very similar to 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 Kuch, to Kuzer one one seven, and we can also date back to date back to the the Hexi province in China, Hexi Gansu province. The Dingja Jia tomb profile is quite similar. The Dunhuang Old Temple, the tomb, the, the Tufan Astana tomb. We compare this type of uh, difference type of uh, <clears throat> tomb. We found <clears throat> we found the one one seven cave is very very. Is they bear some same similarity. Conclusion: Because it has a covered bucket roof grotto uh, in this cave, especially in the early 117, the Kuzo covered roof grotto system originated in the Hershey Province, China. This is, this is my conclusion. Thank you for 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 listening. I just uh, give some some picture on in the cave. Uh, I didn't finish. I just uh, give you some some picture to share this. Thank you for uh, thank you for listening. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Doctor Tsing, for uh, keeping the time and for the interesting results that uh, you gave us and. Uh, uh, if uh, there are any questions or comments, use, uh... Uh, better to do it at the end, Yanis. Okay, that's fine. So uh, let's keep uh, the questions for the end and any uh, comments and uh, proceed with the next uh, uh, presentation. Uh, uh, I don't know if it, uh, if uh, Dr. Vespermeanu Stroa is here. I suppose not. So. Not connected yet. Yeah. Okay, so we can uh, proceed with the next one. Uh, it is uh, from uh, uh, Dr. Xanthopoulou, co-author with Leopoulos and Katsonopoulou, and uh, the title is uh, Mineralogical and Geochemical Characterization of Storage Pithoi from Hellenistic Helike in a Romano site in uh, northwestern Peloponnese in uh, Greece. Uh, Ms. Xanthopoulou. The floor is yours. Good afternoon, everyone. Just a second to share my screen. Uh, I cannot uh, share my screen because other participants still share uh, his screen. So, yes, please, uh, Dr. Singh, if you could. Uh, uh,
Okay, I uh, suppose that you can see now my screen, right? That's fine. So, uh, I'm going to present the pre pre preliminary results from the mineralogical and uh, geochemical characterization of storage pithoi uh, from Hellenistic uh, Helic, uh, the Romanocyte in Greece. Uh, the aim of the research is to characterize the Hellenistic pithoi in terms of mineralogy and geochemistry, to convey the technology and make provenance inferences, to compare the Hellenistic pithoi with the early Bronze Age pithoi. Uh, ancient Helic is located in the northwest part of uh, Peloponnese and close to the coastal zone uh, of uh, Corinth Gulf. Uh, Helic was the foremost city of Achaia uh, in uh, the northwestern Peloponnese before uh, 373 BC until its destruction. Uh, it was the sanctuary of Heliconian Poseidon for all Ionians, was functioned as political and religious center and led the colonization of the West and founded the famous colony of Sibaris. During the 2000, uh, the Helic Project's investigation under, under the supervision of the archaeologist Dr. Dora Katsonopoulou uh, was carried out uh, multiple um, uh, boreholes between the Kerenitz River and Seino River and uh, brought to light the first uh, habitation uh, the first indication of habitation uh, here uh, in this in uh, site Clonis, uh, the, in the site Romanos, uh, where it was a settlement of early uh, Bronze Age um, period, uh, while uh, they brought to light uh, several other uh, settlements like uh, uh, this one with a yellow uh, circle uh, from Hellenistic period as well as other ones from classical and uh, Roman period. A few words about the Hellenistic site of Romanos. Uh, under, uh, after the excavation, they, find, they found well-preserved large rectangular tanks with pebbled floors, a four system unit, rooms represented by working habitation and storage areas, dining workshops. Uh, they found early middle Hellenistic pottery, uh, among them uh, were fragments of transport amphoras, roof tiles and plasters uh, and also large storage pithoi uh, that they are the, uh, the, the typology we have studied uh, so far. Uh, the picture show uh, stored, uh, restored the um, large storage pithoi as they found in the Romano site. Regarding the early Bronze Age site of Rizomulos, more than 15,000 ceramic cells were unearthed, distributed in all architectural elements and in every habitation stratum. Uh, among the pottery, they found 70 intact storage vessels came into the light, mainly the destruction stratum of the later chronological phase. In order to investigate the technology and the processes of the ceramic production in the health settlement, the archaeological questions encounter are the following. Uh, what were the recipes followed by the ancient potters with regard to the mixing of clays or tempering of clays? Which were the for firing condition, uh, the conditions they used? How Hellenistic storage vessels are differ differentiated or not from the early broad age uh, storage vessels? In provenance study, the study of the geological formation is crucial since we can correlate the composition of the search with this one of the lithologies and if or about their, their origin. Uh, so I present you briefly the geological formations that we meet uh, in the study area of Helic. In the Alpine basement, uh, we have the upper fleece layers and limestones of Pindos zone. Uh, they are here. And we have uh, Pindos uh, triple zone uh, fleece and limestone that, uh, that we are here. Uh, about places and places and sediments, uh, we met coarse uh, alterations with uh, silty layers conglomerates. Uh, we have conglomerates of upper Pleistocene, alluvium found the depositional environments, uh, like sandy silty layers, recent alluvial deposits, and al uh, alternated layers of conglomerates, sandy mulls, and clay, clays and mulls. The analytical techniques and method we, uh, methods we use for the characterization of basic ceramics, first is the ceramic petrography. We prepare thin sections from the pottery who carry out the systematic description using a polarized polarizing microscope. 
Petrography allows, allow us to characterize composition and texturally uh, the pottery. Thus, it gave us evidence about the ceramic raw material origin and the manufacturing technology. We use X-ray powder diffraction for the mineralogical determination, such as the primary minerals, the neophon minerals, and the clay minerals, uh, in which the, the identification enables us to enable us estimate the final temperatures of the pottery. Uh, we also analyzed uh, the samples geochemically, uh, used uh, the X-ray the, the X -ray, uh, the X -ray, uh, fluorescence method, uh, and the XRF, the WDXRF uh, of the Laboratory of Electron Microscopy and the Microanalysis of the University of Patras, and the XRF uh, instrument of the Department of the Sciences de la Terra e del Mare uh, of the University of Palermo in Italy. Chemical analysis we give information about the provenance since pottery, which was produced in a particular area, carries specific geochemical fingerprint. Uh, so I uh, will present the results from the early broad age pithoi from Rizomilla's uh, site, uh, which uh, this pottery uh, have been examined thoroughly under the framework of my master thesis uh, with the technological study of pottery from the Ladic settlement of Helic. Uh, I studied partly also this pottery in my doctoral thesis uh, with title assessment of the clay raw material stability for ceramic production in northern Peloponnese, an archaeometric approach. And we also um, study this pottery uh, in the under the framework of the research project funded by the internal funding program named Kostadin Karathodori of the University of Patras. Petrographic description of uh, uh, 115 sums uh, in total. Uh, we, we describe petrographically these sums. Uh, among the, them, uh, large and small pithoi uh, that were 23 uh, in the number. Uh, we recognize manstone radiolari and shared temper, few limestone fragments, the particle size uh, up to pebble size class. And the, the micromass uh, was mainly Cargarium. Uh, here we have uh, photomicrographs uh, from the early Bronze Age um, pottery. Uh, in the first photograph, we can see mass of uh, fragments. Uh, then we try to micromass. Uh, here we can see radiolarian chert and limestone fragments. Geochemical analysis were projected on the ternary uh, diagram proposed by Levin et al. Uh, uh, in the, uh, that we use uh, mainly uh, the oxide of silicon, uh, the oxide of calcium and aluminum oxide. And we can see that uh, the early Bronze Age pottery pithoi are plotted on the calcium rich field. And uh, we see also uh, a spread of the calcium uh, uh, oxide uh, that reaches uh, about 35%. Uh, uh, the mineralogical uh, analysis with X-ray powder diffraction, uh, we recognized uh, mainly uh, quartz, calcite, feldspar, elite, muscovite, and clay minerals. And according to this mineralogical assembly, the estimated fire and temperature uh, was uh, under 700 degrees of Celsius. Uh, two sums uh, were characterized by the mineralogical assemblage of quartz, diopside, hematite, uh, potassium feldspar, uh, and we, we recognize also traces of calcite and elite muscovite. And the temperature, according to this mineralogical uh, assemblage, assemblage, was estimated under or equal to 900 degrees uh, to 1,000, uh, sorry, 900 degrees to 1,000 uh, uh, thousand degrees of Celsius. So the early Bronze Age uh, pithoi, considering uh, the occasional extreme size of some uh, storage vessels, often had to model and fire the pot in place. Uh, we, they used bonfire or pit. Uh, they, the ancient potters uh, fired this pottery uh, at low temperatures. Uh, we have the involvement, the involvement of highly specialized and very skilled potters. Uh, while we see that uh, the ancient potters, um, they procured their raw materials from neighboring local sources. About the Hellenistic pithoi from Romano's site, uh, petrographic analysis um, uh, of storage vessels uh, in uh, five uh, sums uh, enables us to uh, recognize manstones, radioalarian radio radio temper, few limestone fragments, the particle size up uh, to pebble size glass, uh, we recognize a micaceous clay paste, 
And uh, in one sample, uh, we identified also microfossils. Uh, here we have photomicrographs from uh, the Hellenistic pithoid from Romano's side. Uh, we can see radiolarian church, clay stones, man stones, uh, again radiolarian church. Here we have the samples with the microfossils, uh, and we can see here seal stone fragments. Again, we plotted uh, the geochemical analysis of the general uh, diagram uh, of silicon oxide, calcium oxide, and alum aluminum oxide. And we correlate them with uh, early Bronze Age pithoi. Uh, pithoi. Uh, we can see that the Hellenistic pithoi uh, are plotted on the calcium poor uh, field uh, in comparison with the other one. And uh, the Hellenistic pithoi are richer in aluminum oxide in comparison with the early Bronze Age pithoi. We also perform statistical treatment of Hellenistic and early Bronze Age pithoi analysis using the S-Plus software. Uh, applied routines established by GeoPro uh, project. Uh, we log ratio transform uh, the chemical analysis using as device or the oxide of silicon. And we use cluster analysis based on hierarch hierarchical clustering, average linkage. So uh, we took the dendrogram, uh, and here we can see with the rectangular that uh, the, um, the sums from Hellenistic uh, Romano site are grouped uh, separately uh, from the early Bronze Age uh, pithoid. According to the mineralogical analysis, Hellenistic pithoid, uh, uh, characterized by the mineralogical assemblage of quartz, calcite, feldspar, uh, elite muscovite, and clay minerals, and the estimated fire temperature for this uh, pottery is under 700 degrees of Celsius. One sample uh, is characterized by the mineralogical, mineralogical assemblage of diopside, quartz, calcite, uh, and feldspar. And the final uh, temperature now is uh, about uh, approximately nine, uh, from, from 900 degrees to 1000 degrees of Celsius. We have a sample also that uh, is characterized by lower uh, percent of calcite. Uh, the presence of elite muscovite and clay minerals, and the estimated firing temperatures under of, uh, 700 degrees of Celsius. And the conclusion of preliminary remarks from uh, our study is that the raw materials used for the ceramics are lo locally available. Uh, they used uh, mainly the third, manstone, elite, and calcite as the components. Uh, third, manstone, and limestone are the more common constitu constituents. Ancient potters followed the same practices, uh, such as tempering. Pithoi were fired under extremely low firing conditions. But Hellenistic pithoi characterized by a micaceous clay paste in relation to early Bronze Age pithoi. They exhibit lower values of calcium oxide in relation to early Bronze Age pithoi. And that is an indication of a different source of clay, of clay exploitation. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Xanthopoulou, for sharing with us um, this uh, interesting uh, study you're carrying out uh, the last uh, years. And um, at this point, uh, I, um, I have to mention again that the discussion and questions will take place at the end of uh, the session, so uh, you may um, note uh, any uh, comments you have for uh, the um, uh, studies uh, that are presenting, presented and uh, we will uh, have uh, the chance uh, to discuss it uh, later on. And uh, at this uh, point uh, I would like uh, to give uh, the floor um, to Professor Alfred vespremenus Troed from the um, University of uh, Bucharest, um, uh, Romania to present the landscape transformation and human adaptation in the northern Danube uh, Delta. Okay. Meanwhile, um, I am. Um, just a comment that uh, this 
Okay, that uh, this uh, paper that um, Professor Vespremenu will uh, present to us is a combined uh, is a uh, collaboration uh, study between the uh, University of uh, Bucharest and um, uh, the French National Center for Scientific Research in France. Uh, Professor Vespremenu, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much, Nikki. Thank you, dear organizers for this uh, wonderful event, workshop. So um, I will uh, present today um, the evolution of the Northern Danube Delta. Um, okay, I hope now it is visible also the presentation. So we'll speak about um, the landscape transformation and human adaptation in the Northern part of the Danube Delta. And um, we choose this um, region of the Delta to present today because um, it is by far the youngest territory from the Danube Delta, which remained uh, the less known part of the, of the Delta. So um, after we concentrated our efforts to understand better the evolutionary pattern of the Danube Delta in the last two decades, in the last two years, we also focused on this northern part of the delta, uh, which is um, the youngest, I said, and also was um, the latest in terms of uh, inhabitation, because the southern part and the central part were um, habitated sporadically from Neolithic times and uh, even heavily populated from the archaic period due to the Milesian colonization and then other waves of Greek colonization of the western Black Sea coast. But this part remained uninhabited till uh, uh, late Middle Age, like 11th century, but then become for a period uh, the main pole of habitation, especially during the 14th, 16th centuries, Anno Dominium. So our aim is to reconstruct this uh, landscape transformation in the northern part at uh, key moments and um, to see what happened from the Greek and Roman periods till uh, Byzantine, Ottoman, and Russian periods, combining uh, classic stuff of geoscientific methods like sedimentology, organic content, magnetic susceptibility, geochemistry, paleofauna, and uh, absolute uh, dating with uh, ancient writings. And um, here is the study site, which uh, we highlighted with this uh, red rectangle for the northern part, and in the right panel, we just show the chronostratigraphy of the existing cores, which were made by us a couple of years ago, and they are marked with um, yellow dots on this map. And the new core, which belong to this new study, are represented by red dots, and they their stratigraphy is shown in this left panel. And here they are plotted from east to west, from west to east, so in uh, downriver direction. Here it's uh, the first, Sir from Sirasa, then Par, Par 2, and so on till, uh, till Kilia. And we'll uh, uh, present shortly each uh, of the main core. This is uh, the Sir core, which is placed uh, near the deltaic apex. And uh, from these diagrams, we could see briefly how um, the main grain size recommends the main periods of the fluvial activation or reactivation. You could see the first period of the creation of the Danube Delta lobe, and then the period when the Kilia, the northern branch, because this is Kilia northern branch of the Danube, which is the youngest, formed respectively in the early antiquity. And then we are moving uh, in this basin. Um, this was, in fact, you'll see, was a very large lagoon, uh, which is known from the antiquity from the Ptolemaic writings, like uh, it's calling Tiagola. And uh, with gray uh, color, we plotted here the lacustrine ridges, so lacustrine beach ridges that were formed due to the uh, northern storms that affected these huge lagoons and uh, contributed to the um, sediment transport to the south and formation exactly like a marine beach plain, but in fact was a lacustrine beach plain. Uh, okay, so in this lagoon, in the western part of it, we had another core, which we call it Par 1, and um, here also is distinguishable the main 
activity, especially the last episode from uh, the mid-antiquity when the Kilia uh, succeeded to enter and tried and um, began to fill with sediments this lagoon. And then the other part of the lagoon, like the core part, Two, which uh, you could see from this stratigraphy, and here are the ages in kiloanos. So you could see this uh, beautiful structure of um, like a crevasse play, and then like a deltaic front, and then uh, the moment when the Kilia um, River mouse is passing over at a large distance in the next next basin, and we can follow it with this other core one. Um, so here it's the Kilia coming and um, then letting just a uh, wetland in this, uh, in this uh, region. Uh, here you also used for the Kil-1 core um, geochemistry and some uh, microfauna analysis. And based on all this multiproxy data, we made a uh, regionalization, a vertical uh, uh, unit zonation, in fact. So it was the unit, the basal unit a, which corresponds in fact to a predeltaic loss. After that, the unit B1, it's an active shore face of a marine embayment. And then it's a lagoon, uh, but with brackish water, so it's a good uh, sea uh, connection. And after that, like a freshwater lake and finally a marshland. So uh, based on um, the multiproxy data from the Kill 1 core, uh, we um, succeeded to know more about um, the eastern part of the northern delta. But um, before to show you the paleogeographic reconstruction in a scenario of conceptual maps, I, I think it's necessary a few words about the microfauna assemblage that uh, we analyzed here. So it's about uh, Ostracoda, and we could see for each unit the presence of um, different species uh, here are absent because it's a loss, but after that, uh, there are just a few in the marine environment with the prevalence of the marine species. And then during the um, Kilia mouse uh, entering in this area uh, was a um, much more diverse uh, microfauna from marine to freshwater species and then become prevalent to the freshwaters. With these um, black and gray marks here, we plotted the presence of a high concentration of the macro charcoal, which were so abundant, they, they uh, colored even the, um, visually the core. Um, and uh, in the next slide, I will show you briefly the macro charcoal and pollen analysis that we performed on this uh, borehole. So here is the macroscopic charcoal, and we could see these two layers, one uh, more intense at this position and the second one here, which um, is true that uh, correspond very well with the ratio between the arboreal and non-arboreal um, pollen present in the borehole. So it's like a confirmation that the periods uh, of um, historical foundation of the Kilia uh, town here is called uh, Kilia, but before during the Genovese times, like in 14 and um, uh, 15th century, was called Lycostoma. And uh, this period corresponds with a reduction in trees, especially in Gverkus, um, in Tilia, and other useful uh, trees, and um, maximal production of the macro charcoal. And the second peak was. Uh, at the end of the 18th and the beginning of the 19th century, which uh, correspond with uh, Russian uh, Turks uh, wars from this period, even with the uh, Crimean wars, which produced uh, another uh, deforestation in the area. And uh, I will not insist more on this, uh, on this diagram to remain in time. And I will show you now the reconstructed um, evolutionary phases for this northern and central part of the Danube Delta. We also included in these maps. So coming from the Neolithic um, times, because 6000 BP corresponds to Gumelnica and Neolithic culture, we could see this uh, large, beautiful old Danube deltaic lobe, which uh, let the northern part of the delta like a um, huge lagoon, which you could see remained for a long period an open water space. And um, after that, um, at, um, in the late Bronze Age, already 
the lacustrian beach ridges were initiated in this part of the southern rim of the Tiagola Lagoon. And now, during mid-antiquity, you could see how the new formed, the youngest Danube branch, Kilia, in fact, this is Kilia, uh, progrades very rapidly and uh, succeeds to fill, firstly, the western basin of the Tiagola Lagoon, and after that, in just two centuries, succeed to cross from in the eastern Tiagola Basin and to create an open sea mouth around 600 years ago. And this is the moment um, when the um, Kilia branch become very important historically because now it is directly connected with the sea. It is shortest and uh, will be the foundation uh, period in the 13th century of the Kilia Likostomo town. So it's the same town, but with different names depending on the sources. And um, after that, in the last three centuries, the Kilia Open Sea Mouse has a um, very rapid progradation due to um, uh, the fact that uh, it uh, carry uh, like 70% of the Danube sediment load. And uh, so this was the evolutionary model. And now, if you allow me just to see the concluding remarks, so this Kilia Northern Branch emerged during uh, antiquity, so around uh, 2,500 years uh, before present. Uh, then the progression of the Kilia River mouth into the Tiagola Brackish Lagoon was relatively fast during uh, the late antiquity and then during the Middle Age. So uh, around 8-700 years ago, Kilia already succeeded to create an open sea mouse and, and this event uh, was the main condition to allow for a rapid uh, development of the settlements on the Kilia branch, which for a period became the most, um, let's say, most active historically from the Danube Delta in, in this interval. And otherwise, um, it's an interesting relation between the geomorphological evolution of the northern delta, including some uh, beach ridge plains like Leta, which is the largest beach ridge plains from the Danube Delta. And uh, we also used the um, mineralogy of the beach ridges from the Leta plain to derive uh, like another proxy of the Kilia open sea mouse formation because uh, on this branch is, it is the Kilia and uh, the last the last beach ridges respectively this part it's composed of Danubian sediments just because uh, the longshore sediment transport is uh, very strong from north to south due to the uh, acute angle of the storm attack so this part is of non-Danubian origin and just the youngest, the eastern part of the Leta Bijrish plain is composed mainly of Danubian origin and corresponds very well with the Kilia open sea mouse formation. So we also use this kind of uh, proxies to may, um, uh, to may find the chronology of different important events in uh, uh, northern Danube Delta formation. And um, I think this was the, the most important uh, part of the presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Vesprin Anustra. It was a very uh, interesting uh, presentation, and an excellent one, and uh, it was uh, very interesting to see all this transformation happening uh, across the landscape. Um, uh, so I, I, I don't know if uh, we can now, uh, Professor Liridis, uh, have some uh, questions and comments uh, on the three previous uh, presentations uh, uh, before. No, no, you can go on, Yanis. Thanks. Ah, so we can go on uh, without uh, the break and uh, go to the next uh, uh, presentation. Well, if if they are ready, uh, yes. If uh, uh, Professor Kirka, if uh, uh, she is present, yeah, we can. It's not connected, so uh, connected. I think we can uh, go on with uh, Professor Zenatin. Is he here? If he is here. Yes, it's uh, uh, Professor Rappenklack. Hello, good afternoon. Um, 
Okay. So, uh, would you mind if uh, you present your uh, work now? Yes, yes, that's okay. Okay, then... Uh, Thank you, Barbara. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Let me uh, present uh, the title of uh, your uh, presentation is uh, People Experienced uh, the Prehistoric uh, Singao Meteorite, uh, Meteorite Impact. Ge Geoarchaeological evidence from southeastern um, Germany. Uh, from uh, uh, the Tsimgao Impact Research uh, Team, and uh, it's a collaboration with the Geophysic uh, Possegel uh, and the uh, University of uh, Wurzburg in Germany as well. So uh, the floor is yours, uh, Barbara. Okay. Uh, do you hear me? Do you see my PPT? Yes. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. In prehistoric times, a major meteorite impact has taken place in the alpine foothills of Southeast Germany. The region is called Chiemgau, hence the event is named the Chiemgau impact. The affected area extends about 60 kilometer length and 30 kilometer width. More than 100 craters range from five meter to several hundred meter diameter. The cosmic body that caused the catastrophe in the Kingao region was probably a rather porous object consisting of various components that broke apart in the atmosphere. The event is also established by the finds of meteoritic material. Furthermore, we have found rocks which have, up to the destruction of the crystal lattice, experienced a so-called shock metamorphism. This is caused by the extreme shock pressure, which in nature only occurs with meteorite impacts. A broad variety of secondary effects includes vitrified and distorted cobbles, carbon spherules, glassy carbon, etc. The Kinga meteorite impact is comparatively well dated to 900 to 600 BC. This means the Central European Late Bronze Age or the Early Iron Age. In the region, evidence that settlements were affected by the event has been found at two sites so far. Here I will report on this evidence and its geoarchaeological setting. I will first take you to one of the biggest craters in the crater field, the Tüttensee crater. This crater, which today is filled by a lake, has a rim-to-rim -rim diameter of about 600 meter, a rim wall of about 8 meter height, and is surrounded by an extensive ejector layer. The crater and, and its ejector layer have been the subject of extensive mineralogical and geophysical investigations, such as a large-scale gravity survey and several ground-penetrating radar campaigns. Approximately uh, 60 trenches were excavated to investigate the extension and structure of the ejector layer. On this occasion, an area about 800 meter east of the Tüttensee crater called Mühlbach, attracted special attention. A number of test trenches of a depth up to two meters encountered a situation that can be sketchily summarized as follows. The autochthonous quaternary ground, which is formed either by a ground moraine or lake clay, is overlaid by a fossil soil of few centimeter thickness, a diametric layer of 0.5 to 1 meter thickness and the topsoil up to 30 centimeter thickness. The dynamic tide shows highly deformed, fractured and deeply corroded stones. Many of them experienced impact shock metamorphism. The layer can be interpreted as landed ejecta from the Tüttensee crater. This impact layer also contains in part excellently preserved organic matter like a strongly distorted wood, animal teeth, bones and several tufts of hair looking extremely fresh. 
The organic matter in this layer must have been embedded extremely quickly and thus come under oxygen exclusion. Finally, the impact layer also revealed distinctly human artifacts. The first find was a quartzitic workpiece of a Neolithic or Bronze Age X. Later on, in six test, closely spaced test trenches, the impact layer contained an unspecifiable iron pin and some pottery shirts. These shirts, unfortunately without any specific characteristics of decor, may be attributed to the Central European Late Bronze Age or the Iron Age. Even when the finds were looking unspectac unspectacular, they were thrilling nevertheless, because for the first time human artifacts were detected detected as part of an impact layer. Let us move ahead to a second location where a settlement had definitiv definitively been affected by the meteorite impact. It is Statham, a village situated close to the eastern shore of Lake Chiemsee and about seven kilometers northeast of the Tüttensee crater and the Mühlbach site. Here, a rescue, rescue excavation again encountered a diametric impact layer embedded in a unique stratigraphy. The impact layer, which had a thickness of about uh, 60 centimeters, was sanded, sandwiched between settlement layers of the Neolithic and Bronze Age and the Roman period. Archaeological finds included ceramics, stone tools, bones, and metal artifacts. The early Iron Age Hallstatt culture, however, was represented by very scarce finds only, and the following Iron Age Latin culture was completely missing. Among the finds featured externally rather unslightly lumps, labeled as slag by the excavating archaeologist. At the right, you can see four of these lumps. We su subjected six of these samples to mineralogical geochemical investigations. It turned out that the slags have both rocky and metallic components, which are intensively intermingled with each other, as you can see from the examples on this slide. Both components have been separately analyzed. The metallic components of the samples have been analyzed by SEM-EDS. One sample turned out to be a highly leaded bronze. The extraordinary lead content ranges between 24 and 44 percent. The composition undoubtedly characterizes the metallic components to originate from artificial manufacture, even when the nature of the artifact cannot be determined anymore. Analysis of three other samples revealed enormous percentages of iron, ranging between 76 and 99 percent, and small percentages of oxygen as well as carbon. The ratio of iron and oxygen promoted us to consider a meteor meteoritic origin, as new studies have shown that pure iron together with comparable ratios of oxygen can also be found in meteorites. Ultimately, however, the ratio of carbon in the samples indicates some human processing. We think that these samples can also be addressed as artifacts. The stony components of the samples were analyzed in thin section under the polarizing microscope. Quartz grains are extremely smashed or have even been transformed to so-called diaplectic glass. In diaplectic glass, the crystal lattice of the quartz grains is destroyed by extreme pressure exceeding 35 gigapascal. 
evidence of enormous shock pressure, this means shock metamorphism, is encountered in each of the six samples. Hence, they impressively confirmed that the Stadthub settlement had somehow been involved in the meteorite impact. In the samples being analyzed, remains of human artifacts and stones showing impact shock are intimately intertwined in the same samples. To our knowledge, these are the first known examples of such a direct coexistence. My conclusions. We can, can say for sure that the Kingao meteorite impact, being one of the biggest meteorite impacts of the Holocene, has directly been experienced by people. At least two settlements have directly been affected by the event. This is demonstrated by a unique stratigraphy at Stottam, where the catastrophic impact layer was embedded in an archaeological stratigraphy. The samples being investigated represent the first examples of artificial remnants which directly coexist with impact diagnostic shock metamorphism. In view of all these exceptional data, you might wonder that I don't report on env environmental and cultural consequences of this outstanding natural catastrophe. But proving such a scenario is associated with major methodological problems, especially in the case of a disaster in prehistoric times. We might, for instance, look at the rapid climatic shift in the 9th century BC and have the idea that it might have been triggered by the Qingdao impact but this shift is ascribed to a sudden decline in solar activity. This illustrates how aware we must be to ponder the question of causal link or accidental coincidence. Similar problems occur in nailing down the cause of a gap of occupation at settlement sites. The absurdity that we cannot say anything about the cultural effects of the Qingyao meteorite impact is one of the challenges of our ongoing research. Thank you. Thank you very much for sharing with us such an interesting um, uh, research about the meteorite a catastrophic impact in a prehistoric site in uh, southeast uh, Germany. Um, we will have the chance to discuss about it uh, in the discussion uh, session at the end of uh, our session. And uh, at uh, this point, I would like uh, to ask uh, the next uh, presenter. Um, I have uh, noticed that uh, um, Dr. Alexandra Karamitu is uh, here. Would you uh, mind uh, to, to take the floor right now? Yes, absolutely, no problem. Okay, great. So, uh, Dr. Alexandra Karamitru is going to present us the use of a uh, carvelet transfer uh, fashion method to combine geophysical images and archaeological research. The floor is yours, uh, Dr. Karamitru, and uh, we're waiting uh, for uh, your lecture. Thank you very much for the presentation. Uh, so, different sensors are sensitive to different properties and therefore each one provides additional information of the underground structures. The main idea of this work is to take advantage of all these overlapping data sets in order to create a more holistic representation of investigated areas by fusing the interesting features and suppressing the noise. So. Uh, we can define image fusion as the process of combining two or more images of the same scene into a single image with higher information content than each of the original images independently. This is an example from the archaeological area of Army City in Kansas in the United States. So on the left is the apparent sensitivity image that depicts the information of uh, the buried uh, buildings and the walls of the building. 
Uh, next is the magnetic susceptibility image, which is more sensitive to the metallic objects. To metallic objects, for example, it, you can see here that it shows the pipelines that are uh, underneath the buildings. It, you can also see in more details the boundaries of this crossroad that it's barely seen in the resistivity image. Now. By fusing these two images together, we end up with a final fused image where we can see the walls of the buildings, we can see the buildings under the buildings, and we can see more clearly the boundaries of the crossroad. So we manage to fuse the useful information of each of individual uh, data sets in uh, one final image that contains all what we would like to see. So let's see now what kind of features we have to deal with in archaeology. So in archaeology, the targets are of different scale. We may have thick city walls, we may have thinner buildings or smaller artifacts. Uh, we have linear, curvilinear, and ellipsoidal features. In uh, geophysical data, often suffer from long wavelength noise, such as background gradients, uh, due to factors such as the humidity of the ground or the topography of the area. Our data may also suffer from random noise or systematic noise, for example, from blowing tiles. And if the method to separate all these signals of different properties is the curved transform. And this is because the curved transform elevates a two-dimensional grayscale image in a four-dimensional space, where in addition to the two spatial coordinates, the features are expressed also as a function of scale, space, and orientation. Now, for our convenience, we treated the geophysical data as 8-bit uh, raster grayscale images, which means that uh, the black color in our images is represented with uh, the number 0 and the white color with uh, 255. Now, the Kerbler transform is based on Ridgeley transform. And we get the transform when, on the initial image, we apply two-dimensional fast Fourier transform, so we go to the frequency domain. Now, by applying the inverse fast Fourier transform to the frequency domain, we move to the random domain, where the random domain is some of the intensities along different angles. Now, by applying the discrete wavelet transform to the random domain, we get the digital transform, which expresses the image along different frequency bands and angles. We use now the Kerbal transform. Let's assume that this is our image. On our initial image, we apply two-dimensional discrete wavelet transform, so we get the different subbands. On each subband, now we apply tiling, and we do this because we want the curved features on each tile to be represented as almost a straight line. Now, on each tile, we apply the Ridgeley transform, as I explained before, and now. We have expressed the image, the initial image, as a function of space, scale, and orientation. Let's see now how we apply the curve transform in our data. Our first area of investigation is the archaeological area of Evropos in northern Greece. Um, archaeological excavations in this area down here revealed an ancient Roman cemetery. So we performed two types of uh, geophysical measurements in two locations the Acropolis, the area of the Acropolis, and the foothills of the Acropolis. Let's start off uh, the Acropolis. On the left is the apparent resistivity image. As you can see, the, uh, the data revealed a rich urban structure with a lot of linear features with an almost northeast and southeast orientation. On the right is the total magnetic field, where we can see that uh, long wavelength uh, features have been revealed uh, that the majority of them follow the same orientation as we see in the resistivity image. So as you can see, we have two images that reveal complementary information at different scales. And we want to fuse this information, these two images, in order to create one final image a more, that represents uh, the area in a more holistic way. So we applied the Kerblet uh, fusion method and we enhanced the coefficients that correspond to the scales and the orientation of the expected structures. Now here are the two initial images on the left, and this is the final fused image. I should note at this point that the fusion takes place only between the overlapping part of the images. As you can see, the final fused image here, this is the boundary between the overlapping part 
which has been taken by this uh, area of the magnetic image and this area of the electrical image. Uh, this part here on top is been only taken from the electrical image. As you can see, we have no information on the magnetic image. However, we have exploited the Carroll transform to enhance the features of uh, the, the interesting features and remove the noise of the non-overlapping uh, part of the images as well. And uh, if you look at this uh, square feature here, how um, more clear is if you compare it on how it looks on the initial image. If you look at the whole uh, feature, this rectangular feature uh, as well, you can see how well it continues between the non-overlapping, the overlapping and the non-overlapping part as well. Same thing on this uh, example here, uh, this zoomed area where we have this long wavelength features on the magnetic uh, image, which is in the final fused image. You can see that the, the majority of this feature has been taken from the magnetic image as it is missing from the electrical image. However, in the final fused image, you see how uh, more uh, clear it looks uh, comparing to how it looks on the initial image. Another zoomed example, where we have the electrical image, the magnetic image, and the final fused image. As you can see in the final image, uh, the, the linear features are sharper and better defined, comparing them to how they look on the two initial images. Another example, this is the, what we see in the electrical image, these uh, areas in the magnetic image. However, in the final fused image, this rectangular feature appears more clear and more complete. The foothills of the Acropolis. Now we have the apparent resistivity image, the total magnetic field, and the final fused image. Zoom the example here. So the fusion here revealed this linear feature that uh, we missed when we looked at uh, both individual images, um, the initial images. Now, uh, this is a good example because it demonstrates that the fusion is not just a superposition of the initial images, but it can also reveal features that were not visible before. Now, the archaeological area of Doriscos in northern Greece. In this area, we have uh, two measurements, the apparent resistivity and the magnetic radiometry. From these two locations, we only have uh, overlapping data sets from these two areas. So we apply uh, fusion using the carrier transform between these two uh, overlapping areas and we got the final fused image. A zoomed example here as well. So we have the electrical image, the magnetic image, and the final fused image. You take a look at this rectangular feature here, how much better and well-defined looks in the fused image comparing to how it looks in the initial images. We can barely actually recognize that there was something there until we saw the final fused image. The other uh, data comes from the archaeological area of uh, Philippi in northern Greece. Uh, here we took measurements using two sets of geophysical data sets as well. Uh, one near the theater, one southern of the theater. This is the electric resistivity results and this is the magnetic uh, image. Uh, for this area down here, we also have a near-infrared image that was taken using a drone. Now, in this work, I'm going to present you the results uh, from this area only. So, initially, we've used the magnetic radiometry image and the apparent resistivity image. And this is uh, the final fused image. If you look at this area up here, you can see how uh, more clear and sharper the linear features look, comparing on how they look on the two uh, individual images. A zoomed example is uh, from an area here where we have the magnetic image, the apparent resistivity image, and the final fused image. Again, looking at the linear features, how uh, better defined are in the final fused image. Another example from the same uh, area as well, where we have uh, this rectangular feature that looks quite clear in the final fused image. However, by looking at the two initial images, we could barely see that there was something there until we saw the final fused image where we realized that indeed it shows something, but it was not clear before. 
Then uh, we've used a magnetic ideometry model with a near infrared image. And we did this because it is known that the near infrared image reveals information of what is happening on uh, the underground, uh, the, the near surface area. So if you take a look at the near infrared image, you can see that there are linear features. And if you compare them with the magnetic radiometry image, you can see that they overlap. So fusing these two data sets together, we put this panel fused in. Again, the results show that there are sharper linear features comparing on the two initial images. Some uh, zoomed examples. Uh, here on the top, we have the magnetic image the uh, near-infrared image and the final uh, zoomed uh, image of how it looks in the fused uh, area. Uh, here, on the example in the middle, we don't have information in the magnetic image here. We have information in the near-infrared image. And you can look how uh, well these two images have been combined, creating one whole image, with, uh, which includes all the uh, interesting features. Same thing here at the bottom. We have the uh, near infrared uh, image here. This is wrong. This is not the apparent this is the near infrared image. Uh, where we don't have information here, because this area is, the majority of this area is covered with trees, so it was not possible to take uh, measurements. However, by fusing these two images together, we got an image that not only combines the two data set, but it also revealed some features that were not very clear uh, on the near infrared image. Same thing on this uh, area up here where we see this linear feature. We have some information in the near infrared image. We can see that there is something in the magnetic image. However, in the final fused image, this feature looks more complete. Finally, we fused all three data sets together the magnetic image, the electrical image, and the near infrared image. And this is the final fused image. So in the final fused image, we have combined all the useful information from the three different data sets. And we try to remove as much as possible the noise. A zoomed example uh, from uh, this fusion, where we have the magnetic radiometry image, the electrical image, the near infrared image, and the final fused image. What is interesting here is the information that is being provided from the near infrared image, where we don't have information here from the two geophysical measurements, as it is not possible to take measurements near trees. However, by looking at the final fused image, we can see where the feature stops and where the trees begin, which is an interesting information for archaeologists to know. We can also see how well the information has been combined between all data sets and how much more clear the linear features look, comparing them on how they look by looking at each of the initial images individually. So concluding, we can say that curvelets is an efficient way to represent geophysical images as it allows handling of different images along different orientations and scales. We can fuse the desired features and filter or suppress the random and systematic noise while the final fused images provide a more complete representation of the archaeological area by integrated features that are detected using different types of sensors. Feel free to contact me for any uh, questions. Uh, thank you all for your attention. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Karamitru, for uh, giving us all these uh, details from uh, the approach of your uh, uh, research group, which I believe that uh, through the case studies that you show us from uh, Vripos and uh, Doriscos, uh, Evropos, Doriscos and uh, Philippi, uh, shows that uh, they substantially improve uh, the geophysical imagery for archaeological purposes. It would be very good, I suppose. And uh, let us uh, save our questions for the end of the session. And go ahead. If uh, you permit me, I, I see that uh, old uh, Kirka is uh, with us. Hello. And uh, let me uh, present uh, uh, the title of uh, her presentation is uh, at the Caria Thracheia, an uh, archaeotopographic inquiry 
on two rural scapes of uh, Phoenix and Sirna in the marginal environment of uh, Bosburun uh, Peninsula in southwest Turkey, based on field data and uh, geoprocessing. If you are ready, we, you can have the floor, uh, Dr. Kika. It's visible now. Thank you. Uh, not yet. Okay, because sorry. Maybe you can serve. Sorry. First. Okay. Yes, you can go on full uh, uh, screen. Yes, it is perfect now. It's visible now. Yes. Thank perfect. you. Dr. Ioannis, it's uh, so nice to be here again today with this beautiful audience, even though I cannot see each. Uh, today, I'll be addressing a big countryside, uh, the Bosborum Peninsula, uh, originally known as the Karyan Kersonesos uh, of the Karyan culture, uh, uh, which dates back to the classical period around five fifth uh, century BC. And here's a piece of land where we shouldn't expect very sophisticated structures or urban elements when compared to some famous Karyan sites. So here we go. Uh, this is the geographical setting of the peninsula falling to the southwestern coasts of Anatolia at the opposite side of roads. Uh, the morphology of the uh, area comes along with fragmented terrain uh, where internal relief is notably high. Uh, the region, as a big water, was totally equivalent to a polis uh, with a well-established network of Kome, the ancient villages, or the so-called demos for each, in the 5th century BC, as I said. Then we see the Rodians coming and making the region one of her dominions by the beginning of the 3rd century BC. It was then called as the Rhodian area. I shall be inquiring about two sectors over this region, uh, one from the middle north, you see up there, and the other from the south. So the objective with this mini study is to highlight the power of the Hora. Uh, was it a conscious decision or it was an alternative route for runaway or was it a development corridor for some specific sites? I'm going to show in a minute. But we looked at this uh, distinguished features of the sites by giving way to different views of space in different periods. The first sample site is Gökçalca, called Gökçalca, picked up from modern Tashija village. Uh, which is ancient Phoenix, and the other, Yokushbashi from uh, Bayer village, matching ancient Sirna. Uh, the compact site of Gökçalca, site one, presumably dates the archaic period, no excavation has been started yet, while the terminus at Quem for the latter involves the post Roman early medieval era. Uh, which is identifiable with a mini absidal structure we call as a mini chapel for today. Uh, for the scope of the research area, we cruised an average aerial radius of uh, three kilometers of the countryside of the two villages. I have no in intention today of fully providing a site or geospatial analysis aided with multi parameters, but aim to demonstrate just one of them with the help of GIS after uh, presenting data we obtained from field work. I'm just back from the field work. Uh, assumption is that these sites were invisible from various directions uh, simply due to our observations and excess range of data uh, at field work. Uh, we then wanted to test their visibility by a multi-point uh, uh, visibility related to their positioning with a maximum one kilometers distance controlled by their natural catchments.
Uh, let's have a closer look to uh, site one, as I said, called Gökçalca. Uh, the site lies at five kilometers distance in the northern border of the Acropolis uh, of Phoenix in the midst of two shallow east and uh, west facing uh, hill slopes. The topography of the hill enjoys the advantage of a steep uh, cliff on the western side. Um, on the east lies the gigantic mass of Lurion of Caleda. Uh, I said the stronghold with high visibility, uh, far as the pier of Rhodes. Um, but neither pottery nor a diagnostic piece turned up here, but the boundaries segmenting the insulae of about uh, 50 rock dwellings uh, remained uh, to date. Overlooking modern Tashija, the modern village uh, there, Gökçalca probably was probably the earliest site known to date in Phoenix. It has a profound view of Saranda Bay and partly Simi Island. Uh, it is directly watched and partly seen by the Brurion of Kaleda on the east. Uh, this is, a, I said, a military fortification, which we think has survived since at least the archaic uh, Greece classical period. Um, here you can see the part of the lowlands of uh, Kaleda, um, a time of ascending for Gökçalca. Now I want to show you some samples of the rock cut units uh, namely dwellings which have clear boundaries uh, drawn by the outer walls. You see the settlement units with cut stone here, partly uh, worn, uh, maybe some of them were used as quarries, we don't know, we are on the uh, issue. But segmentation of uh, space is quite clear. Um, please also see some use of distort ashlar uh, within the boundaries of those uh, dwellings. And some other views from the residential features, entrances, lentils, masonry details. I don't want to go deep, but the manner of construction uh, represents an early style and workmanship here. This is a course wall series in the middle quotes of site one, Gökçalca. I put this slide the one on the right up there to draw your attention to the availability or use of water now in the lowlands of the site down the terraces to see here on left uh, over a plain area. Uh, there are well-defined inner boundaries clearly visible over this site. Uh, this photo also shows uh, the way in which the dwelling units were planned in a simple manner as single chambered uh, spaces. So, uh, Yokushpaju is situated on an elevated area rising behind the major fault, uh, major fault line traversing the lands, lowlands of Sirna. At the entry point, uh, accessed by a trail, we'll come across a lake cistern, a few finished blocks, as if complementary parts of a Hora gate. Then we see a few settlements in a small crater area. The trail continues in two lines after forking to southeast and southwest. Uh, an architecture generally is represented by opposing carton with small sized stones. The southwest branch of the trail passes by a mini basilica plant chapelle now under a sinus brutia. From a bird's eye view, uh, Yokushbashi 
matches the font shape area here, almost squeezed in a uh, mother lip like lens. The Acropolis is not visible here, but its elevation is lower than this aura. Uh, a few house rings are positioned over the agricultural terraces. Uh, we call them as enclaves because they are interwoven with the agricultural uh, units. As I said, at the end of the trail, uh, uh, ascending trail, this starts from the modern highway down left. We recorded uh, remains, mostly late period structures. Uh, this spot is open to the aura, as we suppose. On top, the big domed lathe system with a good view of Sirna welcomes you. Uh, we see a few finished blocks uh, nearby, um, undefined, yet undefined perfect holes carved into rock. They are visible uh, on the lateral surface. The sides are more worn, maybe a socket for a wooden bar or iron crossbar or a hinge posts of the side gate, but probably not test holes for metallurgical or geological uh, inquiry. Just to show you how the site is physically interrupted by elevations over 400 meters, uh, having great shear on the east. The chapelle uh, is uh, half kilometers south of the entry point, the Hora Gate. Uh, it's oriented towards east. Its stone is gone, but absolute uh, plan is clear. Uh, the walls are bonded with brick and rubble, paralleling some cases known from the Karim cities in the north of the Halicarnassian Peninsula. We are informed of the emergence of the churches in 5th and 6th centuries uh, AD due to the, due to the a wealthy atmosphere of the period between the 6th and 4th uh, and 6th centuries around this region. So possible date is the late antique, early Byzantine period. Also late Roman terracotta pieces characterize the period of occupation. Now we ask the simple question, could the chapelle have served a Kome or mini township? You see the entrance from the south, uh, detail of masonry can be viewed here on the left. Up uh, here's the uh, on the left the absolute part where we recorded niches, probably for for uh, liturgical ob objects. Um, having. In this slide, we see the physical comment of uh, two sites. The rationale behind setting this polygon is to check the extent of environmental determinism around these sites. Uh, now, I want to test the sites 
visibility, in fact, invisibility from the nearest highest peaks within one kilometer circle. That was one kilometer circle set according to one kilometer circle at the local scale. Of course, scale. Of course, this this is nothing to do with the regional scale. A set of observer points marked green as possible risky spots were selected in consideration of the catchment zone from different directions. In other words, they were designed to the nearest border lines of the natural catchment uh, area. Please see four observer points for Gökçalca and five for Yokushpoşu due to their relative proximity to the Acropolis. As you see, both fall to the invisible zones coded pink. Uh, this was a one-time operation, and of course nothing was manipulated to get the anticipated results. But a careful note should be that part of the land at Yokushpoşu uh, here, where traces of a few settlement uh, units appear in a limited extent, is slightly visible from the lowlands of Güvençta on its east, which is an expected case in cognizance of the increased elevations uh, around the site. What we see common then, uh, it appears that both sites were at fairly remote distances to save time for escape, uh, it has other connotations, in case of emergency. Site one lies amidst two fortifications, while site like two could have experienced a runaway through the narrow corridor uh, opening to the coast on the east and southeast. The optimum distance wouldn't exceed uh, two and a half kilometers on average to reach a bay or a main uh, road. Looking at the size of the building material, uh, simply the carved stone uh, uh, from the local ground and proximity to fortified areas. Uh, site one could be a pirate base dating far back as the 5th century BC or earlier. We have records for that uh, through literature, through the uh, movements of these illegal people. Uh, it was, a, uh, in a way, a current way of living plus many other communities around the region. The chapel in Yokushbashi supports the uh, regional church uh, typology and those reported from the Gulf of Mangalia in the northern part of the Halikarnazi Peninsula. Uh, Bozuk Kilise, we call it Bozuk Kilise, Bozuk Church at Kameria Island uh, in modern Selimye on the peninsula, uh, is a fine case which was missioned for the diffusion of San Kirikos, a uh, cult that began to be worshipped uh, before the 6th century BC, sorry, AD, over the Dodecanesian and the Aegean Islands. Uh, and uh, mainland was of course. Similar bodies were positioned in the littoral sector. Uh, I would find it plausible to assume it as a prototype of the uh, along shore plant cases, uh, also in contemplation of the peaceful and safer political conditions of the Middle Byzantine period. Uh, from all those, we can conclude that, uh, tentatively of course, that a major reason behind the expansion of the rural scapes in comparatively hard to access sites arises from the motives for direct survival since the archaic period or upon the empowerment of the city or demands in late uh, antiquity. Uh, yes, the stimulus behind their positioning seems to have arisen from the need and surveillance of sense of camouflage due to multi-conditions of the associated periods. Despite similarities, motifs for invisibility must have had nuances in their perceived worlds. Gökçalca site one addresses a naturally sheltered cora on the wings of a small valley, which long slept by way of uh, auto and imposed protection, and then realized itself as it pushed out and spread from a cluster of dwellings and the related community. 
if it was a pirate base, yes, these people had to have families and dwellings and houses. Maybe uh, we could uh, think parallel uh, to uh, how it's given in literature as well. On the contrary, Yokushbashi oriented itself to uh, self-protection through ecclesiastic perceptions and then must have transformed itself into a religious function domain. It might be a case point for the attempts of spreading Christianity all around the region. Uh, we don't normally come across uh, uh, such absolute structures on the highlands over the peninsula. They're all uh, situated in the coastal band. Uh, this is, as far as known, the single case, but we expect further. So, uh, on behalf of the flora and fauna, uh, aquatic and continental, uh, biota and friends and shepherds, uh, thank you for your attention and patience. Uh, I was happy to be here. Thank you. That's the end of my presentation. Thank you for um, this interesting uh, presentation, full of uh, 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 field photos uh, you made us uh, travel with you of, uh, at uh, your uh, uh, study area. Then thank you for that. And uh, now is uh, time to go to the next uh, presenter, Dr. George uh, Contocostas, who will uh, present us the inner city of Athens in Greece, a palimpsest of uh, uh, urban geoarchaeology. Uh, Dr. Kondokostas, when you are ready, please share your Hello. presentation with us. Hello. Uh, you can uh, see my uh, no presentation? Yet. No, yet. Okay. Excuse me. Now? Yes, here it is. Okay. All right. Okay. Um, good afternoon. Uh, in our presentation, we will see how geological and archaeological elements coexist or are integrated between them in the same area. Uh, the dynamically changing environment throughout the human era, French archaeologist Emile Bournoff, as a pioneer of the city's historical topographic study, sketched an intellectual design coming from another century as an excellent designer. Accurately reflects Acropolis as a geological natural object. His detail is remarkable, considering that uh, he did not use devices such as drone or aerial photographs. The Acropolis was an islet in a watery surface many years uh, ago. Mm -hmm. The height of the water line was at the height of 120 meters from the surface of the sea. The, the interaction of humans with the environment and their adaptation to the environmental changes are remarkable. Looking at the map of the historic center of Athens from above, the various versions on plots, the excavations from the water company and the excavations from the archaeology showed how deep is the gradual coverage of one layer by another in the historic center. Compared to Zapion, the difference of the height is half a meter in historical times, reaching two meters in Sidagma to 70 meters in Monsiraki. In the past, the landscape was not smooth ground surface as now, the terrain were rough. Someone would think that urban area is poor for geological study and contains few useful geological data. With all construction that the initial uh, data 
that could provide the references from the tectonic regime have been lost. This thought derives from the fact that in urban areas, the initial surface has been shaped due to the rapid growth in a way that covers the needs of the inhabitants of the region. The land surfaces have been built and sharpened artificially, roads have been constructed, and the hydro hydrographic networks have been changed and shaped, while natural surfaces have been fragmented and degraded, hence the constructed landscape is poor for geological study. In our research, we study the city in the light of geology. We designed geological walk trail where the visitors will use field work skills to identify a range of rocks and geological materials in the built environment and can also be informed about geological and historical features of the area. Mrs. Kondokosta will describe us the palimpsest of the buildings. <laughs> Hello, I'm Anzelika from Dokista, and I'm going to talk about Monastiraki and its historical influence through sketches. During my first semester in the Technical University of Athens, my first project was to capture the elevation differences of the ground in Monastiraki Athens through architectural sketches. These elevation differences result from the fact that the ground level is rising. That is why they can be observed among ancient Roman Byzantine, neoclassical, and modern buildings. In the first three sketches, we can see the gate of the Roman market. In the first sketch, in the first sketch, the material I used in, or, in order to represent the gate and the nature is pencil. And in the other two, I used black ink with a rapidograph. However, in all of them, I tried to intensify the fact that the ground level of the Roman market is lower than the one of the neoclassical buildings in the background. The Roman market was a large monumental complex created in the 30 BC to 54 BC. The design of the market was simply consisting of a courtyard surrounded by ionic columns in lines, with the shops behind them. In these sketches, we can see the Roman market and how it is maintained today. The first one is designed in ink and the other one in pencil. In these sketches, we can see the Watch of Christos, a monument built during the Roman Empire, 30 BC to 54 BC. The Watch of Christos, also known as the Tower of Winds, is a hydraulic timer built by Andronicus Christos, and it is a part of the Roman market. The building has an original octagonal plan, and its perimeter is decorated with representation and personified winds, one on each side of the octagon. In terms of materiality, it is entirely made of marble. Regarding the Byzantine era in Monastiraki Square, the Church of Montanasa is located, one of the oldest churches in Athens, built in 1100 AD. Its type is a vaulted basilica in both of my, sked in both of my sketches I used ink and I focused on intensifying the ground floor difference. There's another sketch. And lastly, the Church of Kavnikarea, another church in Athens of the same period of time. Its type is a complex four column cruciform inscribed with a dome. This design is made out of pencil. Thank you very much. The described sites by Mrs. Kontokosta and some more have been selected as points of this research. We selected stops which were very close to each other. They were in an area with rich geological and historical features, as River Idanos, Hills Dicapetus, the Acropolis, Philopapus, and they had a wide range of rocks in the built environment. In this specific study, Monastiraiti Kapnikarea Pantanas, a library of Hadrian, Roman market is the walk trail that was selected. 
The River Idranos is highlighted after the construction of the metro and the repair of the Monasteraki Square. It's very interesting that the design of the square is in accordance with the flow of the water in the bed of the river. The water of the rainfall follows the slope and the engraving of the terrain according to the flow of the river. It is a unique picture in the city because someone cannot see any other hydrographic network in the center of Athens. A large part of the river flows under the city and you can see its bed in Monastiraki. Tapnikarea, for the construction of the walls were used sedimentary rocks with fossils of the Eocene age. Inside the four columns without bases and capitals from earlier monuments are supporting the dome. Three of them are made from granite and four from green marble of Karistos. The choir is located in Nevia where imperial in property. Pandanasa, uh, Hadrian Library. When someone enters the library, they will, they will come across with uh, Phrygian marble with bluish vines. 100 columns made of Phrygian stone. In the same material, the stoas and the walls are made. The choir is located in Phrygia today in Turkey, where imperial poverty. Also, when the visitors enter the library, they come across with many wells. Roman market, our next stop. When the visitor enter the Roman market, they will come across with the white marbles of Pendeli on the eastern gate. The marble of Pendeli is metamorphosed during the Alpine uh, mm -hmm. origin, origin of late Cretaceous to the late Eocene uh, age and the grey marbles of Phimitos on the western gate of the Agora. An indisciplinary approach of education to geosciences was implemented in this walk trail. In this specific study, Monasteraki Capnicarea Padanas, a library of Adrian Roman market, is the walk trail that was selected. Experimental group composed by students of secondary school of Attica were used. Some photo of, of our educational proposal The students observed with Hans Lenz having a close-up view the medium grain crystalline rock with granular texture. In this research, the educational aims were for the students to recognize rocks, be informed about geological and hydrological potential, understand the geological notions. That means to recognize geological time, rock cycle, mountain formation. This work is an attempt to follow research steps set for fourth by inquiry-based learning with five steps. Trigger for interest, reminding of basic knowledge, experimentation, formulation, and application. The results of our research involving the experimental group were compared with the results of our research involving the control group of students of a secondary school of ATCA. The students did strictly better on the experimental group than the control group. On the control group, only 20 of the students could combine geological procedures. This jumped on the experimental group to 95%, being able to state the rules that govern geological procedures jumped from 0 to 100%. Uh, some other results you can see. Students. The results and conclusions, students' understanding, creativity, cooperation, and critical thinking were spectacularly improved. They learned about the river Danos. They could recognize white marble of Pendeli, gray mitus, marbles, green marble of Karistos, granites, and limestones with fossils. The most interesting point of the research was when the student realized that the complexity of the natural world arises from the combination of few simple procedures. And um, uh, it's a video from uh, our uh, walk trail over uh, Monastiraki.
Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Kondokostas, and also Ms. Kondokosta for the nice drawings that we saw before. And uh, thank you for helping us see how you unveil the palimpsest uh, in uh, Monastiraki zone and uh, uh, how was important, how much it was important for that, uh, the use of urban geology and also in combination with archaeology and how this helps very much students to understand how important is uh, geology for the landscape, both uh, the physical landscape, but also the cultural uh, landscape around us. And uh, thank you very much. And uh, I think uh, we can go uh, ahead with, uh, I see that uh, uh, Professor uh, Zen, uh, Zen Latin is uh, with us. So, uh, yes, uh, he can hear us, I yes, suppose. So, yes. Yes. yes, I'm here. So, Yes, hello. So uh, he will go ahead with uh, his presentation entitled Agricultural Identification and Environmental Evolution in the Lower Reaches of the Yellow River, a case study in Niho Fang County in Henan Province, uh, China. The floor is yours. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Uh, can you see my PowerPoint? Yes, it's perfect. Okay, thank you everyone. Uh, I'm honored to be here to present my research. And my, uh, the title of my talk is Agricultural Intensification and Environmental Evolution in the Lower Reaches of Yellow River. Uh, and I'm, this is a case study from uh, Neihuang County, Henan Province, China. Um, you may see the key word of my presentation or, or in the title is agriculture intensification. So how can we understand this word, the, the intensification? What is intensification? Um, if we look back at the long history of human uh, food production or, or food history, um, most of the time are occupied by, we call it uh, hunting and gathering, right? Uh, but in about uh, 10,000 years ago, we entered the era of agriculture or farming. We start to farm, to, to, farm, to cultivate. Uh, but at the beginning of the farming, farming age or farming period, that's, we call it slash and burn agriculture or slash and burn farming, uh, which is mainly uh, enlarging area and get more uh, product products. So uh, with the development uh, of agriculture, we enter another time period, we call it intensive agriculture, uh, which get more food by um, in, enlarging the yield per unit of um, area rather than enlarging the uh, planting area. So the intensif intensification is a process from an intensive agriculture to, um, to from extensive agriculture to intensive agriculture. Uh, when we mentioned agriculture intensification, we have to well mention this lady. Uh, this is a, a, a lady from uh, Denmark uh, called Bosraf. He summarized. He give uh, give us a very good foundation, theoretical foundation to discuss the the, the issue of agriculture intensification. He gives a definition uh, of intensification. Intensification is defined as an increase in the productive output output per unit of of land, and how uh, how the agriculture is was intensified according to Bostrap's model. Uh, she argued that the process of intensification is unilinear, following a course from long fallow to multiple cropping. And why the driving force? She mentioned that population growth. Population growth uh, as an independent variable is the primary driving force of agricultural intensification. Well, although her definition of intensification is widely acknowledged um, about the how and why agriculture was intensified, intensified uh, still on hot 
uh, de debate. So my reason, there are, well, different kinds of theories on how and why um, it, it happened, uh, right? So my research question is, is also about this. How was agriculture intensified? What were input to maximize uh, the output of agricultural production and why? Uh, or what were the driving force of the, the intensification? Well, my research is, is in Henan province, just uh, well inside the red circle. Um, well, I select this area because first, this place is the birthplace of Chinese civilization. It has a long history uh, of, of culture and civilization and many uh, textual or written material for us. And uh, uh, recent years, many archeological uh, excavation work has been done in this area. And also we do some uh, paleo environmental reconstruction. So we have historical, archaeological, uh, geological data to re-examine the different theory about um, intensification. Uh, and my research is mainly based on the, you know, the environment perspective, the environmental factor of intensification. Uh, first, I will show you uh, some of my field work. My field work is mainly at well, Neihuang County, uh, which is at the North Henan province. This is the Henan province. And my field work are uh, mainly uh, done within this area. And within this area, the first archaeological site, we call it Sanyang Zhuang. Um, this is one uh, archaeological site I have been working at. And later I will uh, show you another site called Anshang. So let's first look at Sanyang Zhuang. Uh, Sanyang Zhuang site is uh, well, uh, a, a large segment uh, with a lot of rural uh, compounds. And outside the compounds, if you look at the right uh, corner, uh, right uh, bottom corner of this image, we can see this is the compound. And just outside this compound, there are agriculture fields and um, also the, the roof tiles, the stone tools, and the iron tools here uh, are also, well, excavated uh, within this site. Oh, this is the agriculture fields. You may see the uh, reach, reach of the, the, the uh, fields are still visible, and uh, the footprints of human and um, uh, cattle are still be, could be seen here. So this site, basically uh, is dated to 2000 years uh, BP, uh, which is in the Han Dynasty uh, in China. Uh, well, this is the layout of the site area. Uh, since 2012, we restart the excavation to explore uh, earlier agriculture fields because originally we just find the relatively late agriculture fields dated to 2000 years BP. And uh, we continue digging and uh, uh, find several profiles. And uh, we basically well, uh, get deeper, get more, and, fi uh, and find three layers of agriculture fields. And the oldest one is dated to 4000 years BP, which is in the late Neolithic or early Bronze Age in China. And uh, another layer of agricultural fields is dated to 2005 BP, which is in the warring states in China, or we may say early Iron Age or late Bronze Age, uh, early Iron Age. And uh, the last one, Western Han uh, agricultural fields dated to 2000 years BP. So we have three years of agricultural fields. This is uh, what we find at Sanyang Zhuang, and this is Anshang, just uh, well, 15 kilometers away uh, north to Sanyang Zhuang. They are quite close. And we identify a large facility of uh, irrigation canal. You may see here, I will later show you some more uh, image. 
uh, oh, this is the, the irrigation canal here. And we also find some uh, tombs, burials, and the ash pits around, uh, this, uh, around this canal. Uh, so all this material, all this field data together allow us to do some further investigation or deeper um, research on the how and uh, why uh, agriculture uh, was intensified. Uh, I first I I I would like to discuss or investigate the process or the pathway to intensive agriculture or how the agriculture was intensified. Um, soil, water, cereal, iron; those key uh, production factors are uh, within my research uh, targets. So, uh, for for soil. For soil, we, we may say, I, I will discuss, soil so means field management practice and water about, well, irrigation facilities. Cereal means cultivated crops and iron, well, means farming tools. Uh, let's first look at the soil. I discuss soil mainly by micromorphology. Um, I take my micromorphology samples and make them to slides and observe them under microscopes. Um, well, this is the earliest one um, from late Neolithic agriculture fields. This is the Warring States agriculture fields. And this is the Han Dynasty uh, or dated to 2000 BP agriculture fields. I will, uh, I, I will not uh, uh, talk much about that, but basically from late Neolithic to Western Han, we may see more and more human man management uh, on the land, on the field, uh, such as for for example, this one shows the deep uh, plowing or deep tillage uh, of the uh, land, and uh, uh, we may say various types of voice, including wet, well uh, chambers, channels, and the uh, dusty clay coatings um, indicate uh, may be related to manuring uh, activities. Uh, then let's move to another factor, the water or the uh, irrigation facility. We may say this um, uh, canal or uh, uh, irrigation well, feature. Um, the earliest feature was dated to about 3,000 years BP. This is from um, another site called Anshan. Uh, yeah, the people continue to uh, use this facility. Sometimes it's uh, abundant, and sometimes and later it uh, uh, reconstructed and and was uh, reused. And third factor is crops. We use both macro uh, botanic method like flotation and uh, micro uh, back, uh, botanic method like starch green analysis to talk about the crop uh, issue. For, for uh, macro plant remains, we identified, well, uh, different uh, charred seeds. This is the millets and um, uh, different uh, other kinds of seeds like wheat, uh, millet, and um, uh, soybeans. But uh, if we do some simple statistics, we may find that uh, the millet accounts most of them. The, uh, by the way, this data is dated to you know early Bronze Age, three thousand years BP. So th this is rel relatively uh, early situation, uh, which is millet accounts for most of the uh, seeds. Then we use starch green. Uh, we take starch green from Han Dynasty samples. So this is the later situation. So we, we get, uh, uh, well, starch green images and uh, they are, well, they still have different, uh, well, crops. But if we do statistics, we can see that they are more uh, diversified comparing with the, the early period. This is the Han, the 2000 BP. 
uh, and uh, that one um, earlier period that's well three thousand years BP. So we may say that the food um, are are um, be becoming more and more diverse, and particularly the wheat uh, get more and more used by local resident, uh, comparing with the early period mainly use uh, millet. So this is oh this argument is reinforced by isotope uh, data. This is the Neolithic one. We may say it basically a simple millet based diet. And if we look at the Western Han dynasty situation, it become more mixed. Uh, means more C3 diet like wheat are largely used. So basically it indicates a mixture of C3 and C4 food uh, during the Western Han dynasty. The fourth factor we discuss is, you know, the farming tools. Uh, at Sanyang Zhuang, we've seen only one pond. We identified a lot of iron pieces uh, related to agricultural production. And uh, if we look at the Henan fundings, we, we, I, we, we found, um, uh, all the local archaeologists have found uh, more than 30 uh, iron smelting sites. This is, this, those two images are taken uh, from one of the large iron smelting sites, not, not far away from Sanyang Zhuang and uh, Anshang, uh, my research area. So we may say that from the late Neolithic to the Western Han Dynasty, uh, we, they, there are se several well, phenomena. First, elaborated managed agricultural fields and intensive construction of irrigation facility. And the crops uh, because become uh, diver di diversified and, uh, well, weight is promoted. And also we see, particularly in Han Dynasty, the wide application of iron implements. So then we talk about the the driving force of the agricultural intensification. We mainly talk about the driving force from environment perspective. So first, we reconstruct the paleo climate change. We uh, collect several data and uh, well, reconstruct um, and collect the data together and reconstruct the, the trend. We see that from 4,000 years BP to 2000 years BP, the, the signal uh, changed like, like this, and it reflects the climate become more and more uh, dry and, uh, and, uh, and cold. So, maybe yes, maybe we can go ahead with the next one. Apologize. Okay, uh, let's go on to the next uh, presentation and. Um, Maybe during a discussion session, we will have the chance uh, to to see the few last things that our uh, last presented uh, represented did not manage uh, to to provide us. So uh, the next presentation is uh, by Professor Serafim Puglos, uh, entitled "An Oceanographic Insight in the uh, Submergence and the Resilience of the Pablo Petri Archaeological uh, Site." Professor Poulos, uh, if you are ready, you may share um, with us your PowerPoint. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Nikki. And uh, unfortunately, my my camera does not uh, work properly. And uh, beyond this, uh, we have a, I may have a, as well the problem of internet connection because I'm from the house. But uh, and. But I think that uh, I managed to 
to present uh, this uh, this work. Uh, in, any case, in any case, the site the site is amazing, so it will uh, pay us back. <laughs> <laughs> okay, it's well known, yes. Um, this is an oceanographic insight to the submergence and uh, to the resilience of the Pablo Petr geological site. This is the our title. It's a work uh, by me and uh, and Mrs. Panagopoulou, which is an archaeologist. And uh, the scope more specifically, the insight in the relative sea level changes in the Pablo Petr area to reveal the hydro and morphodynamics that influence the monument to consider the leading factors causing the deterioration of the monument, the building stones, for example, and to propose some mitigation measures against monuments' de de deterioration. This is a position of the Pablo Petri, of the Pablo Petri town, of the, of the archaeological site, which is at the very end, at the very northeast end of, of Peloponnese. And in this picture, you can see better the, the area. This is the site, the geological site. It is a submerged Neolithic Bronze Age uh, town, about five to three thousand years before present, like now in water depths of between two and five meters. And is located to the north of the homonymous islet, small island, this one, uh, which is uh, as well the name is Pablo Petri, and of course to the east of the passage between the Elaphonisus and the, and the Peloponnese. This area is also called the Vatica uh, Bay. Uh, this is a more close uh, pictures from the site. This is the submerged uh, monument here and some photographs from the monument uh, itself. Uh, the first uh, archaeological remains have, uh, were identified in, in the beginning of the 20th century, 1904, by the geologist Fokio Negris. And, uh, the, but their importance was not widely recognized until the middle of 1960s by Nicholas Fleming, who revisited and documented about the existence of the prehistoric uh, time. Now, <clears throat> what we know about uh, the area from our point of view from the oceanographic or coastal geomorphological point of view. The settlement should have been established at five to three thousand years before present near the rocky island of the Pablo Petri, but should be in elevations uh, beyond the reach of the waves, which means higher than the wave run up during, of course, extreme events, which is estimated, as we see in the following uh, slide, that uh, could be at least at two meters above the pre uh, uh, two meters from the sea level at that time. Today, the monument lies in water depths between two and five meters, which means that it has uh, has gone and has undergone a relative sea level change, subsidence, in the order of four to seven meters. We further know that during the period of its of uh, its initial construction sea level was lower than its present level by 4.7 up to 2.4 meters or circa 3.5 meters at 4,000 years before present. This means that the monument has not submerged only by, uh, due to the sea level rise, but also due to tectonic activity with a ladder to contribute about 2 meters minus plus half a meter. This tectonic activity most likely is led to the presence of a normal fault separating the uplifted Elafonso Island from the subsiding Vatica Bay, as we have seen uh, in a master degree by Mrs. Pala in 2018. Furthermore, the presence also of beach rock formations along the north coast of Vatica Bay at water depths of uh, between 2.5 and 3 meters, 2.6 and 3.5 age, the second um, series of beach rock, about uh, 1,000 to 1,160 um, after uh, Jesus' uh, birth. And uh, uh, there is another uh, lower uh, beach rock formation, 3.9 to 4.8, eight, uh, to for 480 to 650, provide additional information of tectonic movements, if not short periods of stable sea level, which is under investigation and under discussion for the Olosin, of the Olosin sea level curve uh, in general, not only for Greece, but this is a question, uh, which accounts for about one to two meters. 
Now about the, the hydrodynamic uh, regime, the, the Vatica Bay and the site is uh, well protected from the offshore incoming waves because uh, according to data from provided by the Copernicus and spanning, spanning for about 25 years since uh, 1970, uh, we found out that the maximum uh, wave height is about one and a half meter. Uh, with a period of about 11, when the significant wave height, which means the, the, high, the mean value of the 33% of the highest wave is only 0.4 or in the height and 5.3 in, um, in period. This, uh, and, uh, and all these uh, high, the highest waves come from the south, south, east, uh, with directions between 140 to 160 degrees, as you can see uh, here. This uh, hydrodynamic uh, results uh, provide some initial morphodynamic uh, answers, which means that the monument, which lies in water depths between two and five meters, only during the high waves, or the 1% of the highest waves, is under the, the strong influence of the wave activity. And not all, not all of the monument, but the part of the monument which is shallower than the two than the two point uh, five or three meters. Why you say three meters? Because at three meters we found out that it is, this is the maximum depth that the uh, that the incoming waves could initiate the suspension or other ways to mobilize the seabed. So what what means uh, what we have found out is that uh, uh, according to the hydrodynamic data, the monument, uh, half of the monument, the monument of which is in shallower waters than 2.5 say, meters, are influenced by the high waves when the, the rest of the, mo the monument is not affected by the wave activity. Uh, we have also found out from the literature that uh, there are some morphological changes, which means that uh, some parts of the monument for some period of time found to be covered by sand and one the shallow, its shallowest part, and some other periods not covered. Exactly this is the mobilization of the, of the bottom sediments in, in, at its shallowest area. Now, uh, regarding now the, the monument uh, itself uh, and about uh, its uh, deterioration being under the water for so many thousand years, we have uh, factors considering uh, this uh, deterioration are salt crystallization, aqueous dissolution, microbio microbiological growth, and human, of course, uh, contact. For the first one, crystallization of salts within the pores of stones can generate sufficient stresses to cause the cracking of stone, often into power fragments. Closely related to the crystallization of sand is damage caused by salt hydration and by the differential thermal expansion of salts. The resistance of stone to salt damage depends on the pore size distribution and decreases as a proportion of fine pores increases. The microbiological growth, some types of bacteria, uh, fungi, Fungi, alga, and the uh, lignus produce acids and other chemicals which are able to attack carbonate and silicate minerals. Original, its original construction, of, of course, plays a uh, role, but the human intervention, if we go down, is uh, about possibly removal of building elements uh, from on onshore nearby constructions because the monument is in very shallow uh, waters. And of course, the monument could suffer from uh, arbitrary anchoring and seabed disturbance uh, from uh, propellers, uh, from small boats passing above. Now, in terms of, of what we can do, uh, we need, of, of course, uh, for a periodic monitoring of the state of the preservation. Uh, this is uh, mostly the work uh, for the archaeologists, uh, not only to prevent irrecoverable and damage, but also to plan conservative intervention and or above all to contact cleaning and schedule maintenance operations. Uh, mono, uh, from a uh, oceanographic point of view, monitoring of seabed around the monument with the use of acoustic device, so we do not uh, cause any damage to the monument, uh, such as uh, multi-beam, so we can, we can follow and we can um, 
uh, have a good record for the surrounding area, the bathymetry of the surround area, and there is a possibility to construction of submerged breakwater in water depths larger than six to seven meters in order to minimize or yeah, to minimize uh, wave energy and associated changes in in uh, sea in seabed uh, relief. This is a thought. Uh, here uh, I have another two slides, which is um, shows the um, crystallization pressure and the and the equation which we can use in order to, to see how the pressure increases according to the concentration of salt. And uh, for the monitoring of agents deterioration is again the solubility. Uh, there is the index of solubility between the salt and the seawater, which means that there are some parameters which really uh, be monitored without, uh, without uh, big uh, expenses. Um, in, I think this is uh, my presentation. I'm, I'm coming to the end, and these are the references uh, associated to the to the presentations uh, uh, early early on. Thank you very much for uh, your attention, and uh, I'm uh, uh, open for to answer any questions. If, of course, I know <laughs> I know the answer. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Poulos, for your interesting uh, uh, presentation. Uh, with uh, very important uh, results, I think. And uh, I think now uh, we have uh, concluded, uh, Professor Liridis, with our uh, speakers. No, you can go on with questions, uh, Yanis. Yes, and uh, that's what I wanted to say. That And then we on. have the next session by Cork, etc. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We have okay. plenty of time for questions, but take yes. the papers from the beginning, oh, you know, uh, if there is any question. Please, if uh, there are any questions or comments uh, for the, all the previous uh, important contributions uh, to our session. Can I? Dr. Ioannis, maybe just a comment? Yes, 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 please. Uh, Thanks then. for the contribution of all the participants. But Dr. Zen's project sounds very interesting for me as we try to understand similar uh, though in different contexts and techniques, but including uh, pedology in our uh, peninsula, we classify and try to create terrace typologies also according to the uh, pattern of production, uh, type of products, and landforms in the Peraya in Bosborough Peninsula. Um, we have idea also through uh, the epigraphical corpus that uh, agriculture intensified with the advent of the Rhodians, uh, greatly because of the processed products, uh, mainly the olive and wine, uh, which were sent to export by hand of uh, merchant Rhodians, who uh, greatly successfully controlled the maritime traffic all across the uh, Mediterranean. To keep it short, but uh, something's different here. We have no surface water, but underground karstic reserves, obviously. So products which had uh, tolerance for arid environments uh, were grown on those terraces, most probably. Uh, it's what we also aim to do now. Uh, my project supports the revival of agricultural terraces along with the private initiatives, but I think this is a global agricultural issue uh, as per the goals of this conference as well, uh, similar practices are known as far as I know from Latin America, uh, for instance, Peru or Far East as uh, to be, uh, th those are registered in the uh, UNESCO sites, you know. I think we need to pay uh, much more attention to those marginal landscapes as uh, Dr. Zan is also uh, doing at the same time. This sounds interesting for me, uh, which, which seems compatible with the uh, goals of the, uh, this conference uh, at the global scale. That was my comment. Uh, maybe we can mull over that in the coming periods uh, too. Uh, that has value, I mean. Thank you. Yes, you're welcome. Professor Tsin? Yeah, yeah. Th thank you for your, your comment. Okay. 
Yeah, actually, my my research is um, on on the central central land, right? In the the which has most uh, or longest uh, history of agriculture. And as you as you mentioned, we need to focus on some margin area with maybe with more arid uh, climate, um, and that's really a global issue. Yeah, I I, I agree. Yanis, could you please ask uh, the, uh, the participants to follow an order from the first speaker to the last speaker? So that will be an order somehow, you know, for example, for Lei yes. okay. Shi King, Xing, for example, the first one. The second will be by Stroh, yes. etc. I, yes, I, have, I, have I have the order, yes. Okay, uh, we can continue with uh, more comments and uh, as also Professor Lidis uh, proposed, it would be better to start from the beginning and then uh, go ahead with uh, the presentation. So if there are any comments uh, for the first presentations, uh, presentation that we had uh, today from uh, Leiti uh, Singh. Uh, thank you. Thank you for, for, for inviting me. My presentation is, is, very, is not unfinished because my after I, I, I finished my uh, uh, PhD and uh, I, 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 will, uh, I will finish this <coughs> cave and uh, build, uh, is built a lot of uh, cave using the computer software. I think it's, it's, a, it's a hard work for me. So I just demonstrate, I just show uh, a, a, little, a little case in, in Kazil. Kazil and uh, I, I found some some very interesting route uh, between I, I found I can connection online uh, Kazil Turfan and uh, Hoshi of China. Uh, most scholar scholarship they they from the the Western perspective uh, they often believe uh, the Kazerpentian cave most of Kazerpentian cave. Uh, from the Ganhara arts or, or India, I'm not denied, but uh, but some of came. I think some of came uh, uh, in my research. I found that some of came is come from come from from in uh, come from China, come from Hershey of China. This is very interesting. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Uh, if there are any questions or comments, maybe I could uh, um, make a, a, mostly it is a, a curiosity. I saw on some of uh, the caves uh, that you saw us uh, and the images on the roof there was this blue color. So uh, did I see good? Uh, I, I mean, was that some kind of pigment and uh, on the roof of the cave? In one um, can, can you repeat it? Can you yes, re in, repeat one, it? in one of your images, I, I've seen some blue colored, uh, uh, maybe it was some pigments on the roof of the cave. Uh, a top, you mean top? Yes, on the top, yes. Top of cave. Mm. Uh, there are very different uh, type of uh, top in, in culture and uh, Fudo cave, Fudo cave, the, the Fudo Din, uh, the Chinese name Fudo Din. Uh, the, 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 the Western name is uh, Bakid. Uh, uh, the Western name is 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 is, 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 is oh, although all of the, all of the cave is, is is as for the composition of uh, the cave, um, they are roughly classified into three types of cave in, in Kazer according to their, their shape of the cave. But I found some of the cave, the top of cave is, is very unique. Just like uh, I, I demonstrate in my PowerPoint, I show some. Uh, uh, sorry, sorry, shall I say any colors, pigments, colors, blue, red, you know, do you find any colors, pigments, in your caves? 
No, no, no. Some of it may have. Some of it not mm. have. Uh, yes, there are colors. There are pigments, colors. Because one, mm, one, 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 seven cave is is repeat cave uh, by this name by by scholar, uh, a German scholar named because they have a, 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 a two layer, the mural painting. Mural painting. Mural paintings. Uh, the mural one one seven is has a painting. Has a painting. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Thank you very much, uh, Nikki. Maybe we go ahead with a second uh, presentation. Um, yes, uh, the second presentation uh, was uh, by Alfred Vespremenustroe. So let me ask you if uh, you have any questions about uh, this presentation. I don't see anything in the chat, but maybe you would like to ask something. If so, you may un unmute your microphone. It's the right time. Meanwhile, uh, I have a question just for curiosity. Alfred, uh, I know you are working in this area for so many years. You are, uh, let's say, the expert of uh, Danube uh, Delta. So, what's next? What do you plan? Uh, well, thank you, um, Nikki, for the question. Uh, sincerely, in the present, um, I'm going with the research uh, upstream of the present day Danube Delta. Uh, just because um, during the early Holocene, Danube uh, began to create a delta uh, where it is now just a simple flat plain because, you know, it's this kind of maximum flooding surface, which is very large in uh, area. And after that, some of the present day deltas are relatively smaller than the configuration. So this was uh, one of uh, the present interest to go upstream on the Danube uh, floodplain. But I also have some projects on the um, Black Sea Western Coast um, in other places than the Danube Delta and the different time scales, like the last glacial maximum or uh, mystery period with Black Sea level fluctuations and this kind of things. But of course, I will remain very interested in, let's say, Mediterranean Delta evolution in relation if possible, with the population, with the history. Thank you. Yes. And uh, do you uh, do you have any uh, interest about uh, the future of uh, this uh, delta because of uh, sea level rise? Yeah, uh, and um, uh, actually we we got a project, an international project, which has um, the main objective to assess the modern sedimentation within the Danube Delta Plain. So modern sedimentation means from the 19th century to present day. Uh, so it's the period which covers the recent uh, new transgression. And uh, we are, um, the project is ongoing, so probably next year we'll have the first results. We'll use especially the uh, isotopes of uh, lead and cesium for this and um, on different transects. And after that, we'll compare how it behave. Let's say the fluvial levees, the, um, uh, the isolated lakes and the large lakes, different types of paludal areas. Uh, and um, we we'll could um, assess if the Danube Delta can keep the pace with the present sea level rise. So, <laughs> so yes, it's will be in the very next future um, a topic which we can present the results on this. Yeah. Thank, you. Thank you very much. Thank uh, you. And keep on going this interesting uh, research. Uh, can, I, can I also ask something to Alfred? Uh, yes, yes. From a curiosity also, uh, yes. did you find any uh, anthropogenic uh, indicators in these uh, boreholes in uh, Kilia? In the boreholes? Yes, um, uh, we found that, uh, let's say, dark layers, uh -huh. so different horizon with a high concentration of uh, macro charcoal, which uh, compared with the pollen analysis, uh, they, um, they demonstrated, they proved 
that was a period of intense habitation mm -hmm. with uh, conflicts sometimes, could be some fires from the uh, conflicts, like um, a settlement which was uh, inv invaded by the Turks, it was the case. And otherwise, uh, before was just the deforestation for making uh, clearing surface for croppings and so on. So this was, but in another place in the southern Danube Delta on a borehole, we found, um, we, we call it Karmak, maybe it's a tar name or something, Karmak. So it's like a um, needle for fishing sturgeons, mm -hmm. which mm -hmm. is very large, like um, 10 centimeters or something. Mm -hmm. So we found it at around six meters depth because it was a subsiding area <laughs> in that part. Mm -hmm. And uh, was a confirmation that um, even in the Middle Age, because it was uh, the 14, 15 century period, um, the sturgeon fishing was um, active on some lagoons connected to the Black Sea. So this I remember to be more clear anthropogenic science on, on the borders. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Okay. And uh, there are any more questions or comments? We can go ahead maybe with uh, the next presentation that was from uh, Vajak Santopoulou about uh, the mineralogical and geochemical characterization of pottery from the Hellenistic site uh, of Helike in uh, uh, northwestern Peloponnese. Yes, Giannis, I have one for Vaya. Yes. Vaya, you said that uh, in one of your slides you saw the four millimeter size of minerals in some, some pottery it's you know it as exceptional and a thin and uh, you had put it a exclamation mark why i mean and what does it imply regarding technology or production and use any comment on that uh, i think ah okay yes uh, yes it's uh, so high then uh, it's tempering this is because of tempering because uh, they are the um, uh, crust um, uh, aggregates uh, into the pottery uh, in order to improve the quality of uh, clay. Uh, so that, uh, that, that's why it's so big, the, the size of the fragments. And why uh, you, you, you have ex an exclamation marking? It is not a usual, you know, a data from your experience. Uh, yeah, no, it, it's... Um, it's not usual uh, in um, in pottery in other typology of pottery uh, because in in my case uh, we have uh, uh, storage uh, vessels these large storage vessels uh, they use um, uh, very large uh, fragments in order to enhance uh, the durability of the, this uh, pottery. Okay, so it is okay. useful uh, for. Uh, giving you more information regarding, you know, the, the use of this large pithy, I suppose. Mm -hmm. Okay, that is how you yes, say. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, that's good. Thanks. And more comments? Okay, then we can go on uh, with the next presentation. And uh, this was from uh, Odz Kircher about Antikaria Thakeia and the archaeotopographic inquiry of, uh, do, on two rural scapes of Phoenix and Sirna in the marginal environment of uh, Bosburun Peninsula in southwest uh, Turkey. If there are any comments? I have a, 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 a question, maybe, uh, Denise, if you permit me. Uh, you saw us some, uh, I think that most of the material is uh, limestone from around uh, the site. So, uh, and in some of your slides, you saw us uh, uh, with a question mark if uh, there are, are there any traces of uh, quarrying uh, around the site? Uh, for the second site, sorry, for the first site, Gökçalca is everywhere, even throughout the region, everywhere is limestone. That's the basic material. Uh, but we are looking for 
uh, well-established quarries all around the region, and we haven't found yet. The theory goes that the site was itself the quarry. So uh, it's very convenient to uh, get the local material and uh, arrange the walls uh, and, uh, in accordance with the techniques of the uh, periods and uh, mm -hmm. used. Uh, so uh, that becomes very uh, recognizable in early sites, but in the uh, later, for the later periods, for the site in uh, Yokushposhu and uh, similar uh, enclaves uh, near the uh, village of Sirna, uh, we normally uh, trace them uh, by looking at uh, Workmanship. Everywhere is limestone, but the way in which those uh, sometimes lesbian type uh, walls were used in the early sites, uh, that gives you the, uh, I mean, um, correct impression for uh, effective usage of limestone for the certain period, for the uh, question period. Uh, we have a new member. Uh, uh, in our team, who is expert in uh, uh, micro uh, SAM analysis and is going to get thin sections for that and carry on further research on limestone and perhaps uh, in uh, those that uh, unit I saw, I, I showed you, maybe it was a quarry or a uh, unit, dwelling unit. I don't know, he's going to be on the side and get the specimen and uh, uh, inform us uh, and will come along with his new results uh, uh, on the laboratory. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. So, um, the next one uh, was presented by Alexandra Karamitru. Um, and it was related to, to a method uh, to combine geophysical images in uh, archaeological uh, research. So, is there any question for uh, Dr. Karamitru? I have one, <coughs> yes. if I may. <laughs> yes, of Thank course. Thank you. Uh, <coughs> is Karamitru here? Yes. Hi. Yeah. Uh, Hello. I think. Uh, very interesting uh, you. idea what you have done with uh, Grigoris. <clears throat> I think I think this approach uh, is is essentially the um, random noise attenuation used, as far as I know, in seismic data processing. Is that so? It is quite common. Yes, it is uncommon quite similar, because yes. such a novel. Yeah, yeah, it's very interesting. Such a novel denoising approach. Okay. If I yes. may say, you know, it did is uh, based on um, uh, comprehensive sensing of uh, and the wavelet, the, sorry, the curvelet, because curvelet, my yes. mind goes to the wavelet, you know, in physics, transform, which is frequently used, you know, in seismic data. And uh, the use with uh, geophysical imaging is a nice and clever idea. This is what I think. And you present it. It breaks through also. And this is very important for these experts to, to, uh, to know. The known uh, liquid, uh, liquid, liquid, liquid xenon, okay, yeah. <laughs> sampling <laughs> theorem, which requires that the sampling um, rate must be twice the, uh, the bandwidth, okay? So, uh, without the, in order to have a signal without error, which is translated in the magnetic and, of course, and the resistivity data what we're talking. So this is an excellent presentation. Thank you. That's Thank, you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Is, is any other question for uh, Dr. Karamitru? Okay, then uh, we may uh, go to the next uh, presenter. And uh, if I remember correctly, it was uh, Dr. George Kondokostas uh, together with uh, Aliki uh, Kondokosta with uh, this uh, interesting uh, 
research about the urban geoarchaeology in the inner city of Athens. Uh, is there any question for uh, these two presenters? It's me again. If there is not any, anybody else. <laughs> yeah. So for George, for the process, although at, amongst other duties I have, you know, I may have missed something. Uh, so for this reason, I, I ask for your pardon, uh, dear uh, colleague. But uh, according to your title, the palimpsest in Athens, etc. I would expect to see, probably you have shown, but I, I missed it, okay. Uh, I would expect to see a stratigraphic um, concept. Uh, I mean, past cultural remains versus time on a 3D deconstruction attaching relevant information regarding cultural and geoarchaeological data. Uh, are you intended to do this instead of presenting surface ruins only? It's a very nice idea. Um, the research is a more educational proposal for uh, uh, students. Uh, it has not uh, so deep uh, the scientific uh, uh, um, uh, knowledge, uh, but uh, I will try this. It's a very nice idea to have a um, a 3D also representation. Because palimpsest means we know one layer above the other. But yes. I would like to see, as a, if I was a student, I would like to see these layers one above the other visually, not yes. to imagine it. Yes. Because on surface, you say this is Hellenistic, this is Byzantine, this is prehistoric, but I have to imagine what means this. But if you, if you show a, a schematic representation nicely presented, I mean aesthetically, you know, not only academically, of course it would be academic that <laughs> to produce, but uh, you can see versus time a palimpsest, a real palimpsest. Yes. You know what it's I mean? very nice idea, it's a very nice idea. Uh, that's very good. I would uh, also uh, uh, like to comment something that uh, it's, it's really very interesting um, to bring uh, knowledge like that to uh, our students in the school. So, in uh, that point of view, I, I do like uh, your uh, idea and what you have uh, done. And especially to students that uh, they live around and it is so common that uh, we don't really know the town where we live. So, it is, it is indeed important to bring uh, this uh, knowledge to our uh, schools. And at this point, I would like to ask you uh, if you have tested in in a school, and what is your um, the the feedback from uh, the students that uh, followed what you have done? Yes, uh, my research uh, uh, was done uh, with uh, many students from uh, secondary school, um, about uh, one hundred students. Um, I, I went to their school, I did uh, the lesson uh, with a traditional way and then I, I took uh, students uh, from the same school, other, other students from another class and I, we walk uh, around uh, Monastiraki. Uh, our purpose uh, was to have um, a field lesson not a lesson in the, in the class. So we stay uh, only what they see in the field and uh, we try to, um, to change the way that students uh, uh, watch uh, their everyday um, around uh, surroundings. We want to change this and to see everything uh, uh, in the way of uh, geological uh, uh, glands, uh, archaeological. You permit me, I think it will be very uh, important to have something like this included in these new laboratories of uh, skills uh, for the students of the secondary school uh, that uh, the new law has uh, uh, imported. So 
maybe it will be very nice to have them to propose them uh, as a, a skill laboratory for the students. Yes. Exactly, and, and they may um, take it uh, one step further, and uh, they have done this for uh, the center of Athens, for Monastiraki, but uh, they could uh, give the idea to other researchers to do something similar in their own towns, so uh, students from other uh, towns, they may visit and they may really know the evolution of uh, their area. Of course. Yes. I would like to say something. Yes. Just a comment, since I see that, you know, it is interesting, you know, and the, uh, the choice of wording in your title, you know, carries a lot of weight, dear colleague. So you have to, to make use of that. Palimpsest is not a simple word, you know, it requires a lot of work and a lot of uh, um, uh, uh, collaborations, etc. Just because I'm teaching in the Henan University, Kaifeng, I would like to say that Kaifeng, one of the seven ancient capitals of China, is a palimpsest. You can see in a stratigraphy from going back to from uh, first millennium BC to present day. You can see all the faces, you know, the cultural faces, the dynasties, uh, and of course with the uh, uh, important, significant um, uh, unearthed uh, artifacts, monuments, etc. And they try to do it, you know, in a 3D way, as uh, I recommend it for Athens, you know. Uh, so it's nice to have a stratigraphy somewhere in Athens if you if there is anything ongoing with all these faces and then you can uh, present you can imbe uh, include you know uh, uh, what you presented uh, in in the uh, in this stratigraphic order uh, with the, these nice examples you know uh, it's uh, will be a very beautiful you know um, presentation uh, with a very uh, significant learning outcome thank you Thank you. Okay, we can go ahead with the next presentation that was uh, um, the, the one from uh, the prehistoric Kingao meteorite uh, impact uh, and then geochronological evidence from southeastern uh, Germany that uh, Barbara Rappenglack uh, presented uh, with all this very uh, uh, important uh, uh, data and all this uh, for me it was the first time that I was seeing uh, artifacts included in uh, the material from uh, meteorite impact and uh, if there are any comments uh, or questions yes one for me again <coughs> yes, I suppose the last one uh -huh. <laughs> uh, dear Barbara <coughs> As I have not seen any the more archaeological and archaeometrical references, references regarding the dating, uh, apart from two at the end, I think probably I have missed something. Uh, is it that what we made with OCL dating, uh, or you and your team have additional data since then? And also similar question is for the mineralogical analysis we have uh, shown. Uh, we have made in the past, you remember, with uh, Professor C. Davis and uh, others. Any new, uh, is any new information? Or, I mean, is there any complementarity with past results uh, that we have published or, or not? Uh, I have mean, I have, may I have overseen, you know, the present, your presentation, but um, I have not seen it. Any comment? Um, uh, if I have understood your question right, <laughs> Um, the uh, dating which we now have is um, results from the metallic components which I have shown in my presentation. So highly uh, leaded bronze um, is, uh, we can say, um, in um, Europe, it uh, there exist um, examples of such an alloy in Slovenia and at the, North, at the Atlantic coast, Brittany, Portugal, there do exist such alloys. And um, these are typical from the uh, 11th century BC up to the early Iron Age. And um, now this is one point for our um, dating um, that uh, since we uh, have found such an alloy, 
uh, we say even when when uh, this alloy is not known until now the use of it in our region but uh, there are parallels as i say in slovenia and at the long, uh, atlantic coast and this is one point for our um, dating and the other point is the iron and um Uh, iron artifacts are known in our region. Um, it is starting with very, very, very small and few finds in the ninth century. Now it is rather unprobable, unprobable that the meteorite impact just met the one small um, uh, uh, item of iron. Uh, so we assume that um, the Iron Age had already started when the meteorite impact happened. So um, this is um, Th this, these metal re uh, remnants in these samples are the basis of um, our actualized dating. Yeah, it is different from the oil shell dating we have made. Yes, 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 <clears throat> it is. And Johannes, you know uh, that we had a lot of discussions. What happens with uh, radiometric um, uh, dating and um, uh, in case of a meteorite impact? So um, I think this is also a matter for the future um, to... Huh, To, to bring together the results which we see and now see. We had not have this, we didn't have these results when you did the OSL um, dating. Um, so, um, and this may be a case for further discussion. Uh, what does it mean for the accuracy also of OSL dating in the case of a meteorite impact. Yeah. 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 That's that's okay. But it, from the archaeological point of view, we know that the, uh, you know a dating an artifact uh, purely from typological grounds, uh, 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 um, uh, uh, which uh, uh, artifacts which appear you know in different places in Europe, for example. Is a bit you know tricky you know because the yeah. uh, the metal production I mean techniques technology bloomering or was melting or something like that did not start at the same time in different parts of Europe. No, yes, okay, and and exactly this is a point uh, what we um, did research in uh, to check where yeah. did um, for our region where did things occur and to check whether this um, makes some sense yeah okay All right um, I would also like to, to ask uh, Barbara about uh, this very interesting uh, presentation so um, I have two small questions one concerns the resulting lakes from the area because normally a good chronology of the impact lakes in the area should be a, a proxy which have to fit your results. And I'm just um, curious about uh, uh, the chronostratigraphy, if, if it was made in, in these impact lakes in your area. And the second was con uh, related by one of your slides when you presented um, a horizon made by the impact, which was uh, uh, positioned uh, over an Neolithic settlement and other an Roman uh, layer settlement. So, if you can comment, thank you. Okay. Um, uh, I showed, concerning your question to the lake, um, there is one crater filled with a lake now, and um, uh, There hasn't been any um, you, uh, such uh, something like a drill core. I suppose mm -hmm. that you are asking yes. for yes, yes. Um, uh, um, there was um, not by our group, uh, but by another one. They wanted to drill, but um, it was forbidden by the administration because of um, uh, water protection. 
the admi- so it, there is no drill core at at yeah. all. So and um, yeah, um, the other um, uh, but. Um, when we speak about drill cores, there do exist drill cores from the Lake Chiemsee, which is not a meteorite crater, but um, from the last ice age. Um, and uh, there are drill, is one drill core from uh, Borg, a nearby Borg. Um, but um, uh, these drill cores, they have been analyzed, um, uh, the pollen analyze has been done and um, um, radio, radiocarbon dating had been done. And it is not, um, uh, it has been done in different times um, and it cannot be correlated. This is, so uh, we cannot rely on the cause. So, uh, so this is the question concerning the legs. Um, and what would you like to know concerning this stratigraphy? About that layer, because I was very curious in your image, it seems like being full of uh, white pieces of stones or something. You call it, I don't know, something like disastrous layer or... So yeah, 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 yeah. Yes. About yes. that layer, which, which you supposed that was uh, created like in a moment during the impact. Yeah, yeah. You can yeah. say more about it. Yeah. Yeah, um, in this layer, we have also found um, a number of uh, stones which show, which show this shock metamorphism, which is, which is characteristic for a meteorite impact. We, uh, in this layer, we uh, have found carbon spherules, we have found glassy, um, tectide-like um, items, um, the, uh, what else um yes a number of uh, and even destroyed cobbles um this makes up this mixture of this layer yeah okay thank you thank you for this interesting uh, discussion for uh, that um, uh, um a very new idea for me, I, at least. It was uh, also my first time following uh, such a, a research. And uh, thank you, Barbara, for uh, for this. Uh, now let's go. I think it's uh, time for um, the Coffee. presentation of uh, Professor Poulos, uh, Seraphim, um, and um, the research about Pavlo Petri. Uh, is there any question? for uh, this presentation. It is really uh, interesting to discuss um, about uh, the resilience of uh, submerged archaeological sites, especially um, in a period uh, that uh, we know that uh, sea level is rising and maybe uh, erosional uh, processes uh, become uh, more and more uh, intense. Um, is there uh, anybody from the audience that uh, would like to ask something, uh, Professor uh, Pulius? I would like also to make a comment, maybe, uh, uh, for Professor Pulius, that uh, if, if there are, or ask better, uh, if there are any correlations with uh, similar uh, subsidence in the areas around uh, Pavlo Petri, uh, if uh, you know there is also this. Uh, uh, um, geopark uh, close to Aya Marina from to the uh, eastern side of uh, the peninsula. So, are there any co correlations? I mean, uh, it is the similar thing that we see there, and also it will be very important for these sites as well, where these sites should also be protected uh, in a similar way, let's say. Uh, for the moment, our uh, investigation uh, was focused on Pablo Petri uh, area, uh, principally. And so I, I, I am aware about some other areas close by and I uh, would like also to, you know, to have a correlation. But uh, at the moment, uh, the answer is uh, negative. <laughs> I don't, uh, we do not uh, have uh, done 
such a correlation. Mm -hmm. Thank you, thank you very much. Okay, at uh, this point I think that the uh, discussion session has uh, been uh, closed and um, um, I would like to make uh, a general comment. Sorry, sorry, Nikki, sorry, I just received a message from um, uh, Professor Chin, Chin from uh, China, he didn't finish. Can, is he in? If he's in, he can present three, four slides more, he said. Yes. Oh, wonderful, yes. wonderful, yes. of course. If he's in, can, can you see? Yes, yes, he, we can see him. Okay, then. Uh, okay. Yes. Yeah, uh, I'm sorry, I, I didn't complete my presentation, yeah. actually. Uh, so if time allows, ready? I... Yeah, yeah. I mean, if time allows, I can continue yes. my presentation. Yes, yes, please. Yes, please. yes. Okay. Uh, I will. Sh yeah, I will start from, from here, from these slides. Uh, we talk about, uh, oh, yeah, we have already talked about uh, the climate change. Um, yeah, we, those slides. And uh, another environmental factor is the Yellow River. Um, this is the, the, the red uh, star shows where my research area was. And uh, we can see that it's just in the middle of the Yellow River channel changes. Those those lines are historical, um, the Yellow River cha changes uh, from well one uh, three thousand years BP to uh, near recent, uh, and from this DM we can we can see that my research area is just at the alluvial alluvial fan um, showed here. And uh, I, we may see the ancient uh, Yellow River Channel uh, from the, 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 the DEM, the Digital Elevation Model. Uh, so, and, and this image shows the recent flood. Um, we can see behind those farmers are, they are it's not a pool, it's, it's, it's a, actually the farmland, uh, but uh, the farmland was completely uh, submerged by the a flat river occurred in uh, July this year. So just, it just uh, happened. So this area is frequently influenced by the, by the Yellow River floods. Um, to reconstruct the depositional process of this area, we take samples from the Sanyang Zhuang profiles and uh, do a lot of geo-archaeological sediments uh, analysis. We do particle size analysis, we do um, magnetics, we, we also uh, do some uh, component analysis. So based on the, the, the particle size, the magnetics, the sediments, uh, components, we can basically reconstruct the uh, depositional process. And uh, we can see at the um, we from the four thousand years BP to two thousand years BP. Sometimes it's it's relatively stable, uh, and uh, the paleosol formed, and then uh, flat deposits formed, and paleosol flat deposits, paleosol flat deposits that come again and again. Um, particularly at the Han, at the Western Han Dynasty, we can see that uh, uh, there is a thick flood deposit uh, at the Sanyang Zhuang profile, and uh, the uh, particle size analysis that shows that it's a, a high energy flood, um, just right uh, above the the, the Han Palisol. So. Uh, we, we see that from the 4,000 years BP to 2,000 years BP, climate changed and the Yellow River becomes more and more unstable. Um, so that that's what we can say drier and the pro properly cooler climate happen and more frequent and intensive flooding events. This intense, in this environment changes kind of uh, induced or 
uh, result in the intensification of agriculture. Uh, local residents tried their best to, to uh, mitigate the influence from the worst uh, environmental conditions. So they uh, built, they managed their agriculture fields, they construct the uh, facilities, irrigation facilities, they diversified their crops, and they uh, try to use new techniques from iron tools. Uh, so my model is different from both Rob's model. I pro provide a technology-oriented multi-linear process. So the field management practice, cultivated crops and farming implements uh, dynamically evolved from late Neolithic to the Western Han Dynasty. And as for the driving force of uh, agriculture intensification, I suggest an environment-induced multi-factor model. Um, the environment changes, increased risks of crop failure and famine, disrupt the balance of social system, and you induce a process that results in uh, initial agriculture intensification. So yeah, basically that's my talk. Thanks for your attention and uh, thanks for letting me uh, complete my presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Jin. And also thank you for those beautiful images of uh, the profiles. They are amazing. <laughs> and uh, uh, thank you. So if there are any additional uh, comments on uh, the presentation of uh, Professor Jin. Uh, maybe I would like to ask if you also try to use uh, mineralogical analysis for your profiles, uh, like uh, X-ray diffraction. Maybe it will give you more data as well. Uh, you mean which matter? X-ray diffraction for mineralogical XRD? And yes, XRD. Okay. Um, yeah, we use XRF actually yes. to mm. Yeah, to perfect. identify the the sediments, the the, the elements of yeah, the, the elements. Uh, sediments. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Maybe um, give you like, some more information and compare them to the elements and uh, very yeah, 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 and yeah. I agree. Yeah, nice maybe, and yeah. also I think ICP and maybe some sometimes isotopes can also provide other uh, data sets. Mm -hmm. So, so in the future, I will uh, yeah consider use mm -hmm. more method to. Yeah to do that, to complete the, the analysis. Thank you. Thank you very much. And if there are any, no uh, comments uh, more, then uh, I will pass uh, uh, the microphone to Nike Velpidu if you want to uh, close our session. Thank you. Thank you, Yanis. Uh, I would only uh, wish to make a comment about this uh, session. It was really... Um, an honor uh, for uh, for us to be here with uh, all of you, and um, you covered so well uh, a session entitled Environmental Geoarchaeology with many different uh, aspects, and we had uh, with us uh, colleagues, uh, um, very experienced uh, young researchers, and uh, and it, it was it was everything here. And uh, at this point, I would like to congratulate um, uh, Vajek Santhopoulou, who was uh, the youngest, uh, I think, uh, person in, uh, in this uh, room. And uh, to mention Thank you. that I am really glad that uh, we had uh, uh, with us a, um, a young researcher starting uh, her research in, uh, in uh, the same site and then go on to the next uh, uh, step, to the next, to the next, and now you are a post, uh, postdoc uh, researcher, as uh, I saw from your uh, presentation. So well done, uh, and keep on going uh, with uh, your uh, uh, nice uh, research. And, uh, and uh, a big bravo goes also to, to those people that are supporting you to, to do what uh, you are doing. So. That's it. Thank you, uh, everybody, for being here and uh, making uh, this session interesting uh, for uh, for all of us. Also, many thanks to Professor Li Jis and uh, Professor Chan Hong that gave us the opportunity to chair this uh, very, very uh, nice session.